Well, all right, here we go, everybody. Welcome to episode number 95 of Sports Cards Live. It is Saturday night, May the 1st, 2001. My name is Jeremy Lee. Before we get started with tonight's episode, I do want to thank last Saturday's guests. We had a few of them. We had Joe Perot, my boy from Santa Cruz. We had Billy Celio from Upper Deck. And we also had Chris and Christina from Card Ladder. I want to thank them for doing their giveaway for the one-year pro membership to their Card Ladder service. I also want to thank last Saturday's After Hours guest, Carvin Chung. Always so insightful. Happy to have him on as a regular. I want to thank everyone also for joining us on Sunday, last Sunday, for the PWCC auction watch party. Had a lot of fun with that. That was the third one. Planning to continue those guys and planning to even do their new premier auctions as well. We'll see how those go. Uh, next Saturday, our guest will be longtime hobby industry insider Dave Sleepka. I'm excited to have Dave on. He's got he's got a lot of insights, and we're gonna have a show with him next Saturday. Tonight on After Hours, I'm sorry to announce that Brody will not be able to join us on After... Brody the Kid will not be able to join us tonight on After Hours. He had to pull out last minute, but we will have Joe Perot. Again, my man from Santa Cruz. He'll be joining us on After Hours as a, as a last minute call-in. So I want to thank Joe for doing that. I want to let you guys know we are on our way. We just passed 2,750 subscribers. Thanks to each and every one of you. On our way to 2,800. I want to shout out all the podcast listeners Thanks to all of you as well. And as always, I want to shout out the Big Three Hockey on Instagram. Give them a follow. Great supporters of the channel and great account to follow. Also, Major League Sox, guys. Again, these right now there's even a better promo code I noticed. I think they have a 25% off for Mother's Day, something like that. Check them out. They got Vladdy Jr. socks in their store. So check them out, MajorLeagueSocks.com. And a reminder for everybody, the Virtual Sport Card Expo, I'm going to remind you all the way leading up to it because I'm super excited, will be June the 19th and 20th, sportcardexpo.com, free admission. Check that out. I will definitely be set up there for the third time running. I want to let you guys also know, we now have a Sports Cards Live club on Clubhouse. So if you're on Clubhouse, be sure to join the club. And uh, if you're not on Clubhouse yet and you are a member of the Sports Cards Live Facebook group, there is a link there with invitations. So they're not really limited. They they allocated 100 invitations out for the club. So still lots left there. Feel free to join Clubhouse through the, through the Clubhouse link that I posted on the Facebook group. And the final shout out will be to my buddy Adam and Basketball Card Fanatic Magazine now in print. Check out that magazine if you haven't yet. Okay. Thanks for Letting me get through all that, everybody. Let's get to tonight's guest. He got his first taste of the hobby with the 1988 Fleer basketball set on Christmas morning, a gift from his grandmother. In 2012, he bought an LCS in Indianapolis. Actually, it was nine years ago today. So we are going to wish him a happy ninth. Favorite Notre Dame, Fighting Irish, the Indiana Pacers, the Chicago Cubs, his favorite athletes are Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Derek Jeter, and Peyton Manning, originally from South Bend, Indiana, currently hailing from Indianapolis, Indiana. Let's bring him out. Andy Albert, welcome to episode 95 of Sports Cards Live. How are you doing tonight, my man? Doing great, Jeremy. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I've been excited for about two months since you had called me and asked me if I could be uh, on the show with you. So thank you so much, my man. All right. Oh, man, it's a pleasure to have you. You know, um, it, it's cool to have you, Andy, because I mean, it's great having all my guests, but it's cool to have you, uh, you know, because I met you in person at the National in Chicago in 2019, came by your booth, and I was just really impressed with how friendly you were and your staff was because you had a pretty big booth and I, i'll tell you i felt right at home hanging out of the booth i bought Good. a couple cards from you that during the show they're going to be my pc cards of the day we'll show them off later on tonight but uh and then at the trade night that uh, ryan johnson card collector two organized we got to spend some time together there as well and you know i i just uh i it's going to sound weird, but I really liked you, man. I really liked you, and I liked uh, I just liked the vibes I, I felt when I was hanging out at your booth. So uh, it was a no-brainer to invite you on the show, and I'm glad that it worked out for us tonight. Well, the feeling is mutual, my friend, just so you know. That's why when you I got that invitation, the uh, first instinct was yes, yes, yes. Let's join. <laughs> let's have some fun. Let's talk, talk hobby, and let's talk shop, and let's have some fun with this whole thing. 
For sure, man. For sure. Well, I'm so glad that it did work out. I'm going to throw out everybody. Uh, Indie Card Exchange on Instagram on the ticker right now. It's at Ball Card Exchange. And uh, the website is on there as well. So be sure to check Andy out. If you're not already following him on Instagram or the shop on Instagram, please go ahead and do that, everybody. All right. So let's let's jump in. We'll go. We'll welcome everybody in the chat after the first topic. But let's jump in and talk a bit about your origin. Uh, you know, Obviously, you own a shop. We can see behind you. I love the background. You're going to give us, guys, he's going to give us a tour of the store later and tell us a bit about when he moved into this particular location. But let's uh, let's go back to sort of the beginning. I mean, as we know, you you got your first taste uh, with that 88 Fleer basketball set Christmas morning. But take us sort of from as a kid right through till opening the shop. What has your hobby activity been um, until now or until opening the store, I should say? Ooh. Loaded question, but I think we can start chronologically, right? Get started first. And sure. uh, yeah, 1988, honestly, I mean, being in Indiana, everybody loves basketball. Uh, and and no offense to you hockey people up up north, you know, <laughs> we, we just have a competing season and uh, we chose basketball in Indiana. But it is, uh, it's something that I've loved since I was probably six years old, having a basketball hoop in, a, in an area in the backyard that I'd go out and shoot hoops all the time. I mean, all the time, Jeremy, I'd I'd get a thousand shots a day. And when I was in fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, eighth grade, I'd always shoot baskets and I love basketball. So it just was synonymous with my grandma saying that, Hey, I know my grandson loves basketball. Let me get him some basketball trading cards. And literally at 1988, 10 years old, she gave my brother and I a box of 88 Fleur basketball to split. He got 18 packs. I got 18 packs and we ripped it and had a blast. And I literally never looked back since then. So it's been so much fun. I mean, so then you keep moving forward, right? You know, teenage Andy, Andy, you know, my parents had a business and they were able to travel everywhere. So they traveled all over the Midwest and all over the country. And I was able to go to different national sports conventions like the Atlanta national back in like, I think it was like 1992 or three, something like that. Um, you know, my parents dropped me off at the front door of the Georgia World Congress Center as a 13-year-old kid. It doesn't happen anymore these days, folks. You know, I've got a 14-year-old son. I would never drop my son off in Atlanta, Georgia to walk around on his own. So just things like that. I mean, I got to go to any type I could find a local card shop. You know, now we Google it, right? Back in the day, I was literally looking through a phone book. I'd go to yeah. a hotel. I'd be at my, you know, family that lived out in other places of the country. I'd be looking for in the phone book, where's sports cards? Where's baseball cards? How could I find them? So, you know, and you're looking also in the early, late 80s, early 90s, which wasn't the prime of the sports collecting era either, as we all know. Yeah. The good news is I literally loved basketball and that's all I wanted to collect. So thankfully, there's a guy named Michael Jordan that I can continue to collect and follow and have fun with. And, uh, yeah. I mean, the rest is history. I just, high school, I went into it and would go to card shows and set up tables. My parents would wonder what the heck I'm doing, but I had an absolute blast doing it and was able to collect Kobe Bryant's and the Michael Jordan, you know, the inserts. I just thought they were cool looking cards. You know, I really didn't care about the value per se back then. I just thought they were cool looking cards. And then that kind of stemmed into college, college years, less collecting, obviously more school, dating my girlfriend, who's now my wife, you know, things kind of shifted a little bit, but I still had that love for cards. And I would have a local card shop that was about 15 minutes from the campus of where I went to college. It was tiny. I mean, tiny. It, it would, you could probably fit four people inside the shop, but it was sports cards and that's all that mattered. And I was able to buy and keep the love going um, because a lot of people, they lose their passion in high school and college, right? Because there's yeah. just so many other priorities that you focus on. Um, get into college. I'm buying, I'm having fun, uh, having a little bit, you know, of a setback, which I would have loved to collect in 98, 99 and 2000 when I was in college, but I didn't, uh, as much. Um, and then I got out of college, moved down to Indianapolis, 2001. And the first thing I did got married and looked for a local card shop. The local card shop that I found is now the one that I currently own. So I, I mean, I was the guy's I was a friend of the owner. He was ready to kind of retire back in 2012. And I, I definitely was more aggressively pursuing things saying, you know, what do you want to do with this place? You know, I really have a passion for owning a card shop. I've always wanted to since I was a kid and he was nice enough to give me the opportunity. It took us about six months to talk and, you know, really get him to feel comfortable with making that transition. And uh, I bought the shop May 1st today, 2012. And uh, he worked for me. His name's Richard. Still thank him almost every year for, for letting me buy the shop from him. He worked for me for four years 
after I purchased the card shop because I was still doing a full time job working in lab diagnostics, healthcare, and everything in sales uh, for five full years after I had bought the card shop. So from 2012 to 2017, owned a business and had a full time job taking care of my family and making sure that I did not step into a card shop and full of debt without being able to collect any income. So, you know, it, trying smart. to be a smart business person, trying to, you know, make sure I was taking care of my family and then also make sure that I could pay for my employees and buy the product without having to, you know, scrape and claw to try to continue to survive. And uh, 2017, January of 2017 is when I felt the freedom finally take place and, and uh, go full time at the card shop and have never looked back. And I absolutely love it. Love the people, love the shop, love the atmosphere, love everything about it. Love meeting people like you at the national so that we can talk across borders and be able to share our loves. I mean, I could talk all night. I guess I know we only have two hours and you, you have like 18 things on the agenda to talk to me about, but man, I love it. I absolutely love it. We, we got that's that's yeah. awesome man your, your your passion is obvious it's great to see from a, a card shop owner it's nice that when you bought the shop that the old owner worked for you i mean obviously he yeah. knew the customers he knew the shop it's not like you were having to leave it in, in the hands of somebody that had no experience so that that yeah. was a, definitely a great benefit for you i think a lot of people would appreciate that but um okay well that that's really cool i wanted to know though you know what when you were when you were wheeling and dealing in between, you know, what sort of cards were you wheeling and dealing with before you opened up the shop yourself? Because, and I, I'm asking that this is a loaded question because we chatted the other day, yeah. And you mentioned that you know you were well. I'll let you I'll let you talk about what you mentioned, but tell us a bit about what you were what you were dealing in before you opened up the store. Oh, we have to talk about it, huh? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, high end basketball. You know, we all know that high end basketball is a major gamble. I was a 20, 30 something year old guy and wanted to gamble on cards. And I opened up so much exquisite and ultimate collection and SP authentic and tops Chrome and tops pristine. I mean, all the good stuff back in the day, Bowman Chrome. I mean, you name it. I was a SP game use. I, so the cool thing about own, uh, have being friends with the owner of that shop, he really didn't have a huge customer base, but he had kind of a few big customers. And I was definitely one of those. Well, I was the big basketball customer. He let me have first dibs on any product that came out. And if I wanted two cases, I'd open two cases and pay him. If I wanted none, you know, he'd sell it to somebody else. But it was really cool, the relationship we had, because I opened up so much good stuff. Like, you know, 0304, we hear, ooh, there's this thing called Exquisite coming out. I mean, I'm only getting three boxes, Andy. You know, would you like one? They're six hundred dollars a box. I'm like, yeah, I think I think I want to try one of those. I really do. I want to try a box of exquisite for six hundred dollars. One box, Jeremy. One box I opened. Yeah. I got a Dwayne Dwayne Wade True RPA out of ninety nine. Crazy. Uh, legit. I mean, a, a three color patch, beautiful Dwayne Wade True RPA out of ninety nine. I'm like, this is a cool card. I mean, I'm not happy about Dwayne Wade, but this is a cool card. You know. So I kept the Dwayne Wade for like a year or two, just thought it was a cool card, ended up selling it for like 2000 bucks in 2005 or six. So yeah. made triple my money. Yeah. Move on, move on. To yeah. Right. Right. But well, no, I'm I mean, like I'd put stuff on eBay, you know, before eBay was, you know, the big thing um, before people would return stuff for saying the card was not authentic or scratched on the case or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, I dealt with some of the guys that are big players in today's market, you know, the, the, uh, Minnesota Miracle, Ryan. I don't know if anybody knows him, but one of the biggest high-end LeBron collections you'll ever see. I mean, he would buy stuff from me all the time. I would buy stuff from him. Um, just that's the kind of stuff I did. Anytime I had free time, I mean, I wasn't, we didn't have kids yet. So my wife supported the hobby as long as I was able to still pay the bills and pay the mortgage. And uh, yeah, that was it. She was a, she's a, she was a teacher. So she was really busy too. So I always looked for a side hobby and it was sports cards and golf. That's what I did. Yeah. Well, the reason I, I, I asked that is because I remember dealing with you at the National and you made it very clear to me that, you know, some of the cards in the showcase are actually your personal collection. It's going to be mm -hmm. tougher to trade them or purchase them from you. Yes. And so, you know, you're you're a, you're a shop owner, but you're also a collector to this day. And yes. that's that's a bit of a, a balance that I think you need you need to toe the line on. Right. Like how do, how do you decide what goes from the personal collection into the into inventory at the store? And vice yeah. versa, when someone brings in a card that you really like that you might need for your personal collection, I mean, I guess if you're the president of the company, you can decide to put it in your personal <laughs> collection. Does yeah. that happen regularly for you? Are you moving things between PC and stores inventory? 
Uh, not as much anymore because I've limited my PC. I mean, I've kept it to basically two things. Number one, Michael Jordan inserts and parallels. That's it. And then I'm a huge Notre Dame football fan. Um, grew up in South Bend, Indiana area. And uh, I collect the players who got drafted into the NFL from Notre Dame. So I only collect them, though, in their N uh, NCAA uh, Notre Dame uniforms. So it makes my PC a lot more minute when it comes to that stuff. Um, Jordan, Kobe inserts and Notre Dame is all I PC per se. Everything else I consider as an investment. Uh, then I make the decision on when is the time to sell? When's the time to trade? Anything like that. So you really have to, it's tough. I mean, don't get me wrong. It is tough. I have so much sentimentality to so many cards that aren't Jordan Kobe or Notre Dame that it's hard, but it, the more you develop in this industry, you know, I encourage every single person out there to have a PC. Don't do it just for the flip game because it's, yeah. it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be fun long term. Um, if I didn't have a PC, I'd lose the, the excitement of walking in my shop every day because I get to talk to other people like yourself who have a huge PC. I know about your hockey PC. You know, it's, it's amazing to hear kind of stuff that you have. I know about your yeah. Jordan PC. Um, so, yeah, I mean. It is. It's a difficult decision. I would say there's no objectivity to it at all. It's literally uh, emotion and heart and trying to make sure that I'm not overindulging and hanging on to too much stuff. Yeah, for sure, man. Okay, <laughs> no. yeah, that, that's a great answer. It's it's an honest answer and it's a collector's answer. So um, yeah. I appreciate it. Okay, let's, uh, let's see who we have joining us tonight. It's customary on Sports Cards Live to welcome the people in the chat. So we're going to do that. And then we're going to get into some more stuff, some more discussion here. So we got Rocco Rosato with us. Good evening, Rocco. We get hey, the Rocco. checkered flag. That's pretty funny. I've started watching that F1 uh, documentary on Netflix. I'm only like three episodes into the three seasons, but it's pretty engaging. I'm really, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, so good evening, Rocco, Jeremy Pringle. Good evening to you. We're getting a virtual hug from Thomas Newman. We got Dennis Lescombe. We got Charles from Card Canucks here. Jeff McMahon, Corey Carr. Good evening, everybody. Frank Ostella. Good evening to you. We got Todd McDonald, Lee Haskins. Happy to have you listening in, Lee. Yes, Frank, we have another great guest tonight for sure. <laughs> we got Fire Sports Cards. Ha thank you for joining. Gia Maz, good evening to you. Yes, it would be late for Brody for sure, and Joe does not sleep. We got Joe coming on after hours a little bit later tonight. Jeffrey Hart, good evening to you. We got Absolute Authentics back in the game. Good evening to you. Victor from All Time Greats blog, good evening. We got Sanderson to Orr. Andy has a colorful wall. He sure does. I when when Andy came into the studio, you know, before, a few minutes before we came on live, I said yeah, the, I, the background is awesome, man. That's such a great backdrop for the show. Thank you so much, David Talbot. Good evening to you, Canner Collects. Great to have you here. We got my boy Daniel A. We got Kelly Winters. Absolute says those were the days. Thursday night mall event rooms were packed with eight foot tables of cards. Kids buying and selling. Rem yeah, the high school gymnasium. No shows. I remember those back in the day too, for sure. We got Tyson Lee, sports card of the best, been great for my mental health over the pandemic, right? We, you can always count on your cards. That's what I've been yeah. saying lately. All yeah. that's what I've been saying. Absolute reminds everyone to hit that thumbs up video uh, button, like the video. Thank you, Absolute. I appreciate that. Mickey Pas Pascariello, good evening to you. Toa, what's going on, my man? Colin Murray wants to know what is your handicap, Andy? <laughs> uh, I'll give you past and present there, Colin. Past, I was a 10 handicap. Used to play a ton of golf. Now I wouldn't even be on the radar. Let's put it that way. I had four, I have four kids now. So I haven't, I played one round of golf last year, two rounds of golf two years ago. So let's put it at a 30 or 25, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right. We got Mike from Eastridge. He says, I agree. Having a PC helps to connect with your customers. Yeah. Great point, Mike. Agreed. Great point. Card collector. I uh, happy to be live glad to have you live buddy glad to have you live frank says uh, andy ever get to michigan look him up he's a pga professional would love to tee it up and talk cards there's an invitation sounds right good there. frank can you can you give me some tips in the meantime frank that's what i need <laughs> i'm a lefty i'm a lefty so i need a lot of tips help him out frank help him out please MMA, f1 great show yeah i've been enjoying that show psa slab guy what is up with you we got fresh bread in the house we're gonna blow it up Jason Pringle, good evening to you on break time. Jordan Riker, great to see you. Canner collects golf and sports cards in that order for me. What's your favorite course in Indy? Oh, good question, Canner. The favorite one that I played is called Purgatory Golf Course. It is so much fun. And it's literally purgatory. Like if you hit it out of bounds or, or in, in the thick or in the bu bunkers, 
trust me, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> Purgatory golf courts. David Talbot for the F1 fans. What happened to Daniel Ricardo? Ooh, that's a bit of a spoiler for me. I, I'm, I'm only on episode three of the, <laughs> the of, of the doc, and I I was going to watch them all and then try to maybe learn about these guys, but I got something to look forward to, I guess, or not. And Ricardo Canales, good evening to you from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Fort Wayne, all right. Northeast right Indiana, that's right. Right on. Okay. So I wanted to know, you know, you bought the shop. What was the what was the what was the real re not the real re but what were the main reasons why you did buy that shop? Uh, good question as well. Um, the first reason I bought it was because I I in Indianapolis alone. I mean, again, I was thinking micro at the time, right? I was thinking very small. How can I bring the hobby together in a shop that has the ability and the allocations and the the storefront and the history of being open for 22 years bigger better stronger more relational and that's literally the mindset i had so that that was kind of the long-term goal the short-term goal was i'm like this guy has the itch to sell the shop i've always wanted to have one and we just drafted andrew luck three weeks before i snagged or, op or basically bought the shop on may 1st I'm like, this is time to have a card shop because Andrew Luck cards are going to be on fire. Uh, originally, we had agreed to open or buy the shop and me take over. I think it was either August 1st or October 1st of 2012. And I told Richard, I said, Richard, I'll give you ten thousand more dollars if you'll let me take over on May 1st. And he said yes. So he didn't. He he knew why, but it was ten thousand more dollars to him, right? And uh, we made it happen. So that's why May 1st. So, but everything that I had dreamed of, you know, another strategy I had was I'm at the time when I bought the shop, I'm 42. Now I was 33 and I had a son who was six years old. I'm thinking, gosh, guys, this is, this is exactly where everybody my age is thinking. We love sports cards. We want to get back into it because the hobby's fairly strong again. And we all have kids that we can share it with. We have a hobby now that's not overinflated. It's not mass produced as much as it was back in the 80s and 90s. And it's going to be fun again. So hopefully I can help bring more fathers and sons, fathers and daughters, you know, mothers and sons. I'm telling you, it's crazy how many mothers are involved now and daughters are involved. It's awesome, by the way. But just parents and siblings, or parents and children into this hobby. And it's happened over and over and over. And that dream has by far come true over and over. It's a good reason, man. I mean, it's uh, you're, you're community oriented. I, I love it. Um, okay, well, interesting stuff. And Frank Costello says he'll be happy to help you with your game. Colin <laughs> Murray says golf always first, then cards. So, all right, you no know, people that are passionate about golf, they they certainly love their golf. So we should rip we should rip cards while we're on the golf course. We can do that, Colin. <laughs> There you go. Maybe uh, you know, make, make it a bit of a gamble too. You can gamble on there you go. cards, right? Yeah, whoever wins the hole gets a pack or something like that. There yeah. you go. Or whoever, whoever <laughs> loses the hole buys the other guy a pack of their choice. That kind of, thing, that kind of thing. So tell yeah. us a little bit about how the shop, not the hobby, but how has your shop evolved since you bought it through until today? <laughs> uh, physically and financially? Is that what we're talking about? Well, uh, I mean, a little bit of everything. Everything from from I mean you, you've you've moved. We know you've moved. Right. That's on our agenda to discuss tonight. Why right. you moved, where you moved, like kind of what drove that decision. But just how you run the business, uh, the customer demographics, um, yeah. the products you're carrying, anything that comes to mind. How have the last nine? How well? The, how have the first nine years been? And again, guys, it's his nine year anniversary of owning this shop that you see him sitting in right now. So let's congratulate him on that. I mean. Next year would be even bigger at 10 years, but hey, we'll, take, we'll, we'll say happy anniversary at nine years as well. Maybe, but no, we'll do, just, maybe we'll do an interview in person, Jeremy, here at the shop, ooh. 10 years. How hey about man, that? I, if, uh, you know, if the world, if the world comes around, or not <laughs> conducive, I would, uh, I would love to for sure, especially if it would coincide with one of these shows that are, uh, you know, yeah. the Wisconsin Dells or one of these or the Dallas, yeah. maybe on my way to the Dallas show, we can make it happen. We can make maybe. it happen. Okay. So. Yeah, why don't you just talk about the last nine years? I mean, uh, you know, we, myself, the people in the chat, we've all been, I'm, I'm assuming most of us have been into card shops over the years. We've seen how the card shop that we go to, how it's changed over the years. Some have got, some have come, come and gone over that time. You've sustained, you've lasted, you got through a bit of a, you know, you came in in 2012, 2013, yeah, 
2012, and the hobby wasn't as strong as it is today. But you've mm -hmm. la you've lasted and thrived through till today and a year ago when the hobby took off. So tell us about the last nine years. So uh, it's a good, another great question to get kind of get started. But the 2012 era was, you know, like I said, there was more anticipation than there was, uh, you know, solid ground, solid foundation to be able to actually own a shop. I did make the decision, obviously, not to have that be my full-time salary and full-time job because I was worried. I was really worried that I wouldn't be able to have the right healthcare coverage. I wouldn't have enough salary to be able to provide for a family that we wanted to grow. At the time when I bought the shop, we had just had our second daughter. She was born, I think she was five months old when I actually bought the shop. So a lot of things went into play to start the shop slowly have a couple people working for me and just kind of see how things went. And then when I had the time to be able to really put my stamp on it, if you will, you know, my stamp was first step was I acquired a shop that was full of stuff. I mean, full of stuff, no organization stuff everywhere. Um, I would, I would open a drawer and find a six box case of 97, 98 tops finest basketball. I kid you not. That, that is a true story. This drawer that I didn't even know existed in this in the back part of the shop, I find this case of 9798. Of course, I opened it. I should have sold it. But, <laughs> you know, I'll, I remember what I pulled. I pulled a gold embossed refractor of Patrick Ewing from that case. So it was kind of cool. You know, I mean, at the time it was probably a three hundred dollar card. Now it's probably a three thousand dollar card. But uh, that that's kind of stuff. Like the first steps that I made when I bought the shop were try to get this thing somewhat organized to figure out what in the world I have so that I can figure out what I need to sell. Can I purge, you know, connected with a bunch of bulk buyers that just took a bunch of junk from me because I wanted to have something where I actually had some organization. You know how long that took? Probably six years. No joke. <laughs> like six full years to feel like we actually had some organization. Um, then hiring the right people, you know, uh, 2014, was a year that I almost had to shut the shop down. Not many people know this. Uh, the local customers do. Um, there were three or four products that came out in 2014. One of them, uh, you Americans will know, 2014 Tops Chrome Football was an absolute, it just combustion. It was horrible. Everybody wanted Johnny Manziel cards, right? Well, Tops decided that they would mass produce 2014 Tops Chrome. As a shop owner, you always give your distributors and the manufacturers allocation numbers of how much you want of a product. Well, we decided we were going to go all in and give them a huge number. And then they would just probably cut us down to like a quarter, a third of what you order, right? We ordered 72 cases of 2014 Topps Chrome football. Guess how many we got? 72. 72 cases of 2014 Topps Chrome football. I mean, I'm laughing now because I survived it. In a matter of two months, I lost $35,000. In 2014, losing $35,000 in a small card shop that hadn't really been well established yet was horrible. I mean, we were scraping the barrel. At, you know, I, I don't mean to throw a pity party because things are fine now, but that's the kind of stuff that we've gone through and evolved from like buying the shop in 2012, going through the peaks and the valleys. You know, I, you, I bought collections at the time literally to flip them in bulk to somebody else and make 5% just to be able to make some money to continue to build. And something I tell people a lot of times that are in the business aspect of this now, Jeremy, is, you know, you, you build to get to the point where you need to be or want to be. And we're at the point now, do I live in regret? No, a lot of people do. And I, I encourage people not to live in regret, but there are a lot of situations that I've tried to go through that nine year tenure of trying to get to a point where we could be now that we can take care of customers and be able to financially stand on solid ground too. Um, so, you know, the 2014 era was a rough one. And then, you know, 2015, I was able to hire the man that probably it, what we all call the engine of the shop, Jake Patrick. I don't know if you met Jake at the national too, but the man's an amazing dude. And, you know, I couldn't do this thing without him. And uh, it, uh, the people are also like you had talked about the people are also who you thrive on having in your shop and having be a part of this team. And they have the like mind that I have. And if you have those kind of people, gosh, take good care of them. That's all I can tell you people mm -hmm. as business owners, take good care of the people that take good care of you uh, because they care as much as if they, if they care as much as you do, my Lord, it's, it's, there's no financial price you can put on something like that.
honestly. So um, I know I'm going on tangents. I think I'm answering no. the question that you asked me. You, but, no, uh, dude, you're doing a great yeah. job. You're giving us some really in, some real good insights. I mean, that yeah. 2014 Tops Chrome, that's that's in for brutal. That's but that's a good insight. It helps us understand, you know, who you are and why, you know, why your business is successful. You you got through that. So no, yeah. please continue. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. So again, the people I hired Jake and Jake really when I talked about at the beginning of this question of trying to be organized, 2015 is when Jake started officially full time and I still was just an absolute mess. You know, the place was a mess. There was no organization. I hired the right person because he that's that's his middle name basically is Jacob Organization Patrick. He started just cleansing and getting things in places they needed to be, creating spreadsheets of inventory, things that I just didn't want to do because I, I'm a people person. I wanted to interact, I wanted to be the face of the business, but I didn't want to do all the nitty-gritty stuff. Nobody does, right? I mean, I Jake guess does. Jake does and he does it well. <laughs> um but no, I had two other employees at the time that were working part-time and then Jake and I were the only full-time people and we were working our butts off, you know, how can we, what do we need to sell to be able to cover payroll next Friday? The, those questions we were having for, you know, probably I'd say a year or two straight, you know, what do we have to, what number do we have to get to, to make sure that every bill is paid and payroll is covered and the distributors are paid. Yeah. I love that kind of stuff because that makes you stronger. It galvanizes you. Um, and that's what's created the shop atmosphere now. And then we remodeled the shop in May of 2018. So three years ago, that was one of part of those upper deck co-op programs. Are you guys familiar oh, yeah. with that? Yeah. We had gone down to the upper deck convention down in Orlando, Florida in January of that year. And we're like, this shop needs a makeover. This, I mean, people that have been to my shop, if you're watching right now, they realize how bad the old shop was. We had roof tiles that had water damage. We had drywall that was busted out. It was a nasty old building. The back part, I mean, the bathrooms looked like a truck stop bathroom. It was disgusting. Um, you know, all that being said, we needed that remodel and we were all about getting it remodeled and upper deck ponied up 50% of the cost of that remodel. And I was all about it. So, you know, I still to this day, am thankful for what upper deck did because it made me realize that we could pour in funds and revenue to put into improving the aesthetics of the shop and not just having the product and, and a few cards that people want to buy. So it created a really much better atmosphere that brought in a lot more people. Because There'd be people that'd be like, this place is nasty. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt bad about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, but that's, that was kind of the uh, reputation of sports card shops too. Um, they weren't, you weren't there to have a visual. You were there to just look down and see what was in the display cases and really make a quick little wax wall check out and see what was there. So um, it, it evolved. So that's, that's the May of 2018 remodel. And then now we're here and it's been three exactly full months that we've moved into the new shop. That's double the square footage. We had 1800 square feet at the old place. 900 of it was storefront. The rest of it was all storage and office area in the back. Um, this now has 2,100 square feet in this front part of the new shop with about 1400 square feet in the back with office and storage. So yeah, I'll take you guys on a tour and everything, but this was a dream about a year ago when I knew that my lease was up at the old shop and that I had an opportunity to move, I had scouted out this location for a while. This place is a former Mexican restaurant, which is kind of funny. I don't know if you've ever, did you watch the videos that I did on Instagram kind of yeah. from start to finish? I mean, nasty Mexican red tiles and in, in a horrible kitchen. I mean, you guys, the, the hoods in the kitchen area, they found two dead rats in them and everything. So I mean, Only gross two. stuff. Oh, yeah. So no, it, the new shop, I, it's a dream. It's an absolute dream come true. And I walk in here and just smile every morning I walk in. So there uh, you yeah. are. I can't, yeah. Well, th thanks for that. Thanks for that. I, I can't wait to walk in there uh, and, and see uh, in, in your own uh, element there. Hopefully a year from now, that'd be really cool. And on the 10th anniversary, we'll have to keep that in mind for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, one thing that, that sticks out to me is that a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of card shops that I've frequented in my life, the owner is uh, sometimes it's just one one guy and then a few part timers you know or that kind of thing what's what does your staff look like now how many people work in the store how many how many staff are on at a time uh, oftentimes you go into a smaller car shop there's only one person there if that guy has to go right. to the bathroom they have to lock the door lock the door <laughs> right yeah so what what is it what, what how many people do you have on at any given time uh, in your shop 
I'm going back to that question like really quick. When I first bought the shop, one of my sales goals was to make sure I made one sale on average every day at the new card at the old card shop. Because the owner back in the day, he'd have days where he never even made a sale. You know, and, and it's crazy, right? So I said, I'm gonna make a, a one goal is I have there's going to be a sale in this card shop at least once a day. So that succeeded. Thankfully, not one day. There were a couple of days where there maybe was one or two people that bought something, but uh Back to your question. Um, we have eight employees. Eight, six of them are full-time employees, and we have two part-time employees. Um, I, I love my staff. I literally love every single person. We've just hired two new people recently, Drew and Kevin. Uh, Kevin is basically taking over as head of grading because we do a lot of grading consultation services, and we're a certified dealer for PSA and for Beckett. Uh, so they can take all their submissions and drop them off here at the shop. Uh, Kevin is a godsend. He comes from a you know great line of retail business and sports uh, related businesses and stuff like that. So he knows the hobby. He knows retail and he's great with customers. Um, Drew is a recent college grad and I kind of call him the jack of all trades because we just needed somebody to be able to do everything. Uh, and I told you about Jake. We've got Matt. Yeah. Matt's been with me for just over a year. Um, the kid's just passionate as all get out and he works his tail off. You talk about a workhorse. Uh, Dave is a retired athletic director and he's in his late sixties and I call him my card dad. I mean, you talk about somebody who keeps you in check and makes sure that you're doing okay and make sure that you're making the right decisions. Like everybody needs those checks and balances. And Dave does that for me. Uh, and then we have Glenn and Mindy and they're our part-timers. Glenn's retired and Mindy works on Saturdays only and has been part of the card shop for almost 20 years wow. and just loves she loves helping. She loves like building cardboard boxes. She loves helping clean up. She loves talking to customers. She doesn't really know the card industry that per se, but I don't care because she's just such a good person and she still wants to be a part of the team. So that's my staff. And I, I you know, I could gush about them for the next hour and a half that we have. No, it's, it's nice that you want to. It, it really is, man. It really is. Yeah. Uh, but that's a, to me, that sounds like a big staff in the, in the old days, like pre 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that, you'd see card shops that had, you know, six full, six full timers and two part timers. That's a lot of salary. That's a lot of responsibility. You need to bring in some revenue to, to make payroll every, every two weeks. So yeah. I think that, that that's a bit of a testament to where the hobby is and that you can actually offer full-time jobs, help people pay their rent, their mortgage, uh, feed themselves. So it's, it's a testament for sure. Well, okay. a lot of card shops, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jeremy. No, no, you go. You no, go. a lot of card shops, you know, they pick and choose what they want to do as a business. And we've really decided to be kind of the full, full facet of everything. You know, when it comes to grading, it, you know how it is with grading. It takes up so much time. Yeah. I mean, I consult with customers about grading. Kevin consults with customers about grading. We submit everything. It takes time to enter everything. It is a full-time job, guaranteed. You know, we do the online aspect. We've got social media to deal with. We've got, you know, on, you know, we have, we need to have two to three people in store at all times because we do have a bigger facility and we, you know, we average a hundred transactions a day now in the card shop. It's it's definitely a much bigger atmosphere than it used to be. And then we also have Jake who kind of has transitioned into like a COO position where he's back in the office, you know, six of the eight to 10 hours a day. And He's paying bills. He's ordering product. He's dealing with emails. He's dealing with you know appointments that we need to set up. I do a lot of the buying right now, and, and that's everybody's got their own functionality. But when you have that much stuff going on with one card shop, it takes that many people to be able to make it make it run, make it work. Yeah, I'm, I bet, man. Well, it's it's, a, it's great, and I want to get into a bit a bit more of that uh, shortly. Let's just go to a few comments right now. Uh, we've got Rich. Uh, welcome to the show. Rich Toa says, it was awesome to see you guys help out Mealy Cards with a place to deliver the Pokemon <laughs> first edition case. That was crazy. That was awesome. Ryan O'Hara lets me know that my flames are down 2 nothing, and we're probably going to miss the playoffs. Well, maybe, ah. we, get a, maybe we get a better draft pick. Uh, Jim Levitt congratulates you on the nine-year anniversary today of owning the card shop. Uh, Victor from All Time Grades Blog says, I'm in Portage, Indiana. Your shop is two and a half hours away. I'll I'll stop by next time I'm around. That'd be very awesome. cool. Awesome. Jim wants to know how does your memorabilia, i.e., the jerseys and all that, how do they move versus the insanity of the card market? Great question. Very good question. Uh, much, much, much slower, Jim. Uh, the memorabilia is what I call eye candy. It literally is eye candy. So we have the jerseys that are behind me. And then over this direction, we have like framed pictures, autographed pictures. Everything's autographed on the wall. And then to my right up here, 
we have baseballs, basketballs, footballs, hockey pucks that are all signed and everything. I kid you not. We probably sell one or two of those items per week. Yeah. And I love it though. I mean, again, it's beautiful to see it's colorful. It makes, you know, everybody want to kind of look around in the shop and see everything. But to answer that question, nothing compared to the card market. Yeah, not surprised. Okay, let's keep going. Andy, uh, sorry, Beans Ball Card Blog uh, shouts your name. My Ken. favorite card shop owner ever. The shop and Indianapolis Motor Speedway are the only things I miss about Indy. He goes That's on, my say, boy. He goes on to say, "I remember the shop before Andy bought it, and after it was day and night difference almost immediately." Yeah, that's what new blood will do, right? New energy. So that's <laughs> Ken great. Kinsley, I love that guy. I miss him. He's in Texas now, and he's uh, he's been so good to me. And over the years, I know he's really good for the hobby. He's a major collector. You know, you talk about collector versus investor. Ken is a true collector. So what's cool. up, Ken? Good to good to hear from you, man. Uh, well, uh, hello to Ken. Thanks for and Ken. Ken watches the show, so glad to see that connection for sure. Uh, Sanderson Deor says he uh, went into a shop in San Antonio, Texas this week. It was disgusting. Looked around, walked <laughs> out. Having a nice place that's well kept goes a long way to keeping customers coming back. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. For sure. For sure. For sure. We got Stephen Foley from South Florida. Stephen, thanks for joining the show. Good evening to you. We got Mickey Pascarello says hello. I think we saw you earlier again, Mickey, but. Uh, Maybe not. Good evening again, <laughs> Valentini. Good evening to you. Thank you so much. Go Leafs. Go. The Leafs are looking good. Tracy Shamer is looking for Joe. Joe will be on in a couple hours, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tracy. <laughs> Joe, Joe has a groupie. Joe has a groupie. <laughs> Toa said, Toa, I went to the worst card shop ever a few months ago. I won't name it out loud. The guy got upset because I didn't go back and put every card that he had to eat on to ebay comp back hmm. yeah i mean that, that that's an interesting uh an interesting comment you know and I, i'm curious about you actually let, let's talk about this for a second andy sure it's it's typical now you're at a card show you're a vendor at a card show i do it you do it you've got your cards someone comes up they ask you how much or they look at the price tag on a card and then they go to their phone to see oh, what yeah. what an ebay comp was I've done it myself as a customer. I see a card. What's what does eBay tell me? It's just a way to assess the price that you're being offered. What what is your position as the as a shop owner or a, as a proprietor when somebody does and does it happen regularly in the shop when someone's looking at singles? Uh, I always laugh about it because I say, you know, my goal with that person is to finally make eye contact with them, have them <laughs> look up at me. You know, yeah. it happens. It happens every day, all day. Uh, there's, there's nothing to, you can't get around it right now. You know, everybody goes to eBay. Everybody goes to one thirty point, you know, they do all these the searches. I'm fine with it. You know, we, we price based on eBay comps. So the people that know me on a regular basis don't have to look as much because they know my pricing's pr pretty fair. And that's something else that my employees do every Tuesday morning. They all have a section of the shop that they look at the cards to make sure everything's still within range of how we have it priced. So, you know, that's a, that's a big job too. But yeah. th to answer the question, yes, of course they do. Everybody looks at their phone and everybody wants to make sure that they're paying at least fair market value or less, right? Nobody wants to pay more, but, uh, fair market value or less, which I would do the same thing if I were on the other side of the table. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and we do, we do do that. But I think what I really like, man, is that every Tuesday you guys have a consistent. So it, now there's some, there could be some strategy there, right? For a customer, mm -hmm. some prices actually go up. So mm -hmm. I could come into your shop on Monday night before that happens and try and look yeah. for a bargain. Maybe Monday yep. night's bargain shopping at, at IndyCard Exchange, where, right? Whereas Tuesday morning, you know that you're going to, or Tuesday during the, once it's done, yeah you're going to be kind of on comp. Maybe a price comes down and then you're going to get yeah. it for what it more recently sold for. So well, I just I love, good... that you're, I love that you're staying on top of it. That Thank that's, you. I don't know that everybody does that because it's, it's tough work. I have a good real world example that happened yesterday, this morning, actually from yesterday, Jason Tatum had 60 points last night. Everybody saw that, right? Yeah. I had three PSA nine prisms and one PSA 10 prism rookie, Jason Tatum. They were priced accordingly. Obviously everything jumped 20% last night or 15 to 20%. If you look at the, at the eBay counts, all the buy it nows were getting hit and everything. Well, guess what sold today? All four of those cards this morning, first thing between 11 and 12 o'clock, which is great. I'm all about it. I, I'm not going to change my prices right away just because something jumped like that. When Aaron Rodgers said he doesn't want to play for the Packers anymore, Jordan love cards, people were flooding in. Andy, where's your Jordan love cards? Where's your Jordan love cards? 
they're right on the shelf, guys. I haven't changed anything. If you want to buy them for the price I have them stickered at, go for it. So yeah. it's fun. It, it's that's part of the market. Again, as a shop owner that was a collector, I was in those shoes and I wanted to find a deal. And I was always looking, you know, what is that price at? Oh, that Jordan's at 40 bucks. I could sell it for 60 bucks. Oh, okay. I'm gonna buy it. Um, so again, back flip both sides. We do adjust prices up if nobody bought the card and we see that the card's up a hundred dollars, I'm gonna raise it a hundred dollars. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's important to be the the market moves so fast nowadays. It's not like it's not like in the '80s, even the '90s, when you didn't know to change a price until the new Beckett magazine came out. Now, right. I don't. I mean, do you do you, do you use Beckett to price cards ever or uh, vintage cards? A little bit of vintage cards. Uh, yeah. The the non you know Mickey Mantles and key rookies will will still use book value because book value still is kind of running in synonymously with like PSA sixes and sevens which yeah. is kind of near mint, right? So we do use Beckett for vintage, for sure. Cool, man. Okay, uh, Toa wanted to clarify. He says the shop owner was doing the eBay comping. I didn't eBay comp. I left them back on the counter where he put them and he got upset I didn't go back to put each back in the boxes. Uh, was I wrong? Oh, no. was he wrong? It's no. like, I, I look at it like going to a clothing store trying on clothes i never mm -hmm. go fold them up and put them back you you yeah. don't buy them they don't fit you let you don't buy the card it didn't fit your purchase decision shop owner you go put them back i mean yeah. as long as you weren't there just trying to make a mess for him which i, I know Toa wouldn't have been doing you're not wrong Toa. you know if you had this stack of cards 20 cards deep that's the shop owner's job to put them back where they belong so yeah. don't feel guilty my man there you go. Coming from a professional shop owner himself, Eric Perry <laughs> says, congrats on turning a passion into a successful business venture. Yeah, thank for you, sure. Eric. Brent Criswell, good evening to you. Uh, Bean says, thank you for the true collector compliment. Don't confuse <laughs> me with the flip vesters. LOL. <laughs> for sure. Steve Foley says, the Miami show was amazing. Great to go to a show finally. Yeah, with lots of shows in, in, in May of this year for sure. Uh, yeah, and Tracy yeah. says, no offense to Andy. I love you too. That's very nice. Tracy, <laughs> Thank you. Tracy, for the last two weeks, she's been hitting on all my guests. So I, I love you, Tracy. Compliment. Maybe it's a compliment to me or the guest. Probably the guest. <laughs> <laughs> Great to have you back, Tracy. JJ Bama, good evening to you. Uh, Ziggy says, has your access to allocation increased or decreased over the last nine years? Decreased. <laughs> Significantly, Ziggy. Uh, it's, it's very difficult right now, Ziggy. Um, it's definitely decreased. It costs more. Uh, the distributors are playing the game right now, which probably you guys already know. I don't want to get into that, but they're playing the game where if you don't buy the junk products that are you know, break evens or losses, you're not getting any good stuff. Um, not only that, but you're getting less good stuff anyway. And then you have to rebuy the good stuff at basically current market comps that are selling on blowing out, blow out David Adams, steel city, that that's just what they're doing. And people are still buying it because breakers are driving that market. Um, I mean, I, I think you've probably heard this statistics too. I think breakers consist like 75 to 80% of the entire sports card market and card shops are the other 20%. 25%. It's it's nuts. But, In terms uh, of overall revenue or market revenue. Yeah. Market revenue. Mm -hmm. That was okay. a statistic that Upper Deck gave us uh, two years ago when they had their last industry conference. And at that point, it was 70 30. And there's no way it's much any less than that. I'm sure it's more than that. So that's on that's on unopened product because obviously that doesn't include Correct. eBay auction houses, uh, right. the Com C's, the yeah. Star Stocks, and of course the 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 peer to peer trading and dealing that happens, which right. is probably maybe the biggest of all. Well, yeah. strictly unopened, strictly unopened wax revenue. That's yeah, it. yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, Let's no, make, makes sense and good. Good that we can clarify. Joe Perot, who will be joining me on After Hours, says that card shops are the hub of the hobby, which is. I think it, it's true. We, we say that so much, but, you know, card shows are a big, are, are a hub as well. Not, not to say that to take anything away from the LCS, super important, but we got card shows are hubs and as, as are the platforms, you know, the, the Instagrams, the Facebooks, they become yeah. hubs as well, especially in 2020 and 2021. Uh, we have Terry Fortune. Good evening, Terry. Great to have you. Beans Ball Card Blog. Sorry, what was his name again? You, you said. It's Ken. Ken, Ken, I'm yep. going to try and remember that, Ken. I, I do my best. 
Uh, one thing I really loved about the shop is that he had dime boxes. It's the only card shop I've ever been in that had them, and they were pretty popular. Dime boxes. Yeah, we hear about dollar bins all the time. I haven't heard about dime. I haven't heard about dime boxes in, in quite a few years, for sure. We have AJ15. Love that you say you have pricing on all your stuff. I hate when you go to a shop and nothing is priced. That's Me something too. that that's something that actually happened uh, at this at the nationals that we set up at AJ because we had priced out every single card at the nationals in all of our display cases. Multiple people said thank you for having price tags on what you want for these cards because they hated seeing things. You know, you have to ask, what do you want for that? What do you want for that? What's your lowest price on that? I agree with you. I think more people should do that frequently. And it's happening. I mean, I'm seeing all the good dealers at shows and shops and everything, making sure they have price tags on stuff. So hopefully that continues to evolve uh, for the better. And, you know, the same thing can be said for the one-off vendor like myself. When I set up at a card show, I, I've for many years now put the price tags. I put price tags on my cards and I put them on the front of the cards. Not yes. this, not this back bull where you got to pull it out. Look at the price. <laughs> like your price is a secret or something. I never understood why people do that. It's like, I don't know, I'm here to do it to make any deals. Right. Put your, put, as soon as you put your prices on cards and on the front of your cards, you will see your revenues skyrocket. I've been very successful at shows because of that. And yes. obviously the same thing applies it at shops. And I'm sure that AJ15 feels the same way when he or she goes to card shops as well. Um, here's a question from Hockey Hockey that I think I know the answer is pretty, to me it's pretty obvious, but I want to hear your take on it, uh, Andy. He says, what is the value of opening sealed wax when the cost of grading is so expensive? So clarify that one for me a little bit. Hockey, hockey. What's well, the value of opening sealed wax when the cost of grading is so expensive? I think the assumption he's making is that if you're going to open sealed wax, you're going to send singles off for grading, which which okay. if that's the assumption, to me, it's all it's kind of like uh, the, the answer to me is collecting, collecting. Yeah. You don't have to open a box just mm -hmm. to send cards off for grading. Not every card right. needs to be in a slab. So right. uh, to me, it's a it's I don't. The question is a it's a very narrow scope question, in my opinion. Whereas, you know, it's it's it almost is saying that you need <laughs> if you're gonna open, you need to grade cards. Sure. I've never approached it that way. So um I would say I mean, now that you're answering that question, I would say you're only doing that if your intention is to sell online. Because right now, selling online, you really do need to have more graded cards than ungraded cards because of so many returns and so many complaints and things like that. So, you know, there, there is value of grading stuff that you just pulled if you have the intention to sell it, especially if you pull the big cards because you can turn a, let's say, a $1,000 card into a $3,000 card if it gets gem mint grades or something like that, too. So there is value. I mean, to clear, you know, to answer that question now that I understand it. Um, you know, a lot of people will grade your $20 cards thinking they can turn them into $50 cards. And that's a waste of time and money, in my opinion, because of the turnaround times and the cost. But, you know, th there's, there are benefits to getting some of the cards graded that you pull for sure. Sure. But you don't have to grade just because you open, I think is, is the Correct. point that I want to make. Um, okay. Uh, Lucky says any info on whether they will have the Chicago national. I mean, my understanding is they're making to make the final determination by Ju by or on June the 1st. Is that your Correct. understanding or do that is actually, that's an accurate statement. It is June 1st that they're going to make the announcement. Um, I know a few little insider info pieces, but I don't want to be a rumor spreader. Um, I'm not optimistic. Let's put it that way. Uh, it could still happen, but from what I'm hearing and some of the feedback from the city of Chicago and Rosemont and everything, it, it's not looking very good. Uh, hopefully they can move it to maybe later in the fall, but uh, don't, you know, don't take my word for it. It's just rumors and, and other information I've heard. Um, but yeah, it, it should still happen. It just may not be the end of July. Okay. Well, hopefully it does uh, for sure. And hopefully us Canadians can make our way down there. Cause I sure yes. want to make it. If there's a national, I got to get there one way or oh, another. Yeah. We need you. We need yeah, you down man. here. I'd love to. I'd love to go there. Um, okay, we have a. Here's a question from Ziggy. Do you think there is still a need in the modern hobby for distribution, or should the manufacturer sell directly to hobby stores? Do you want us? Do you um, want to speak to this, Andy? Well, we do get stuff direct. The good news is, as a uh, you know, that was another strategy in buying the card shop, Ziggy. That we we knew we had a direct allocation with pop tops panini and upper deck and that's a benefit to having a card shop that's got a kind of a grandfathered in 
uh, 30-year history. Um, the distributors do a lot of good. They carry a lot of you know diverse products. I'm not opposed to distributors. I mean, what they're doing now is hard, but Panini's doing the same thing. Tops is doing the same thing. Look at their direct-to-consumer pricing that they're putting out there. They're kind of going with what the blowouts and the Dave and Adams have things pre-sold priced at and throw it out there on their website for the same price. So, you know, I think the distributors still play a good role in the industry, um, you know, because not everybody, Panini doesn't want to have to ship out direct allocations to thousands of different vendors out there. They can now only ship some of the direct accounts and then the distributors, which are what, you know, half a dozen good ones out there that everybody knows of. You ship all your product to six places as opposed to 600 places. It just is logistically a better option to use a distributor. Yeah, they would have to hire people to handle it. That would in increase their costs and that would increase the price one way or another. Maybe not as yeah. much as the distributor charge. I don't know, but it yeah. wouldn't be just the cost just wouldn't be eliminated altogether. Right. That's for sure. Um, yeah. We have pretend Jeff Wilson back joining us uh I have, confirmed, <laughs> I have confirmed this is not the jeff wilson of it's not sports, sports card cards investor, investor. <laughs> so uh to the fake jeff wilson i'm gonna let you stay as long as you behave uh tracy that is not jeff wilson AJ15 <laughs> says has covid changed how you had to run your shop great question aj the answer is an emphatic yes um no question i mean we had to close the shop down for almost 10 weeks when COVID hit. Most everybody did. Uh, thankfully, we had Instagram and YouTube where we went live. Uh, we had a pretty good following at the time already. So we were able to keep revenue flowing. Um, ever since we reopened, my word, yeah, it's been difficult. The first six months of being back open, you know, you could only have a max number of people in the shop, uh, social distancing. And we were social distancing in a shop that was half the size, which we could only fit about 10 to 12 people comfortably with social distancing in our card shop, which stunk. I mean, I hated it. So yeah, the answer is yes. We had to change everything about how we ran the shop. Yeah. Well, and that's typical, right? No surprises there. Uh, lucky. Thanks for your insight on the date of, uh, on the national happening. Um, <laughs> Z Z I'll go Z A. Uh, he collects Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. We talked about that earlier, but uh, thanks for joining. Za uh, Fresh Bread says, "I believe anything pre-war should be graded, no matter what condition, just to preserve it." I think uh, that's pretty fair, unless you're just a guy that collects complete sets in a binder, then you don't need to do it. But otherwise, I I'm with you on that. Eastridge, Mike from Eastridge Hobbies here in Calgary, in Canada. All we have is distributors, which is needed. Brokerage for mm. small stores would be brutal, for sure. To the pretend Jeff Wilson, how do I know it's not you? I know. I just know because I spoke to the real Jeff Wilson about it. Uh, and Lucky <laughs> K says, do you run breaks out of your shop? If not, have you considered? Uh, we do run breaks. We took a we took a, a break, a hiatus um, so when we moved to the new shop, and we haven't reopened them again. Um, our break site is called Exchanger Card Breaks, and it's just a separate little YouTube channel and part of our website that we have. But we are... When I take you guys on the tour, we actually built a tiny little breaking studio in the new shop that has two cameras, microphones, all that kind of stuff. And we are just about to reopen our breaks. So exchange your card breaks, Lucky. And is there a link there? I'm going to throw back on your, uh, here we go, on the ticker, everybody. There is uh, Indie Card Exchange on Instagram and the website. So I'm sure there's a link there to the group break uh, there is. portion of the business. Awesome. Yes, there is. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. Let's go. Uh, let's go back to to the agenda at hand here. So, you know, something I'm I'm impressed with, and I think we're seeing a little bit more of it lately, is um, the 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 approach that shop owners are taking is it's evolved over. It's evolved. I mean, we've heard it from some of the people who've been in your shop already. You know, it's a more professional approach. When I think of when we think of professionals, we think about doctors, lawyers, accountants, engineers, that kind of thing. We don't necessarily think about card shop owners but you are you are sort of an example of a professional card shop owner in my opinion i mean just by the staff you have the organization what um you know do you see that being the trend moving forward is part of it you mentioned the upper deck uh, co-op where they helped you do a mm -hmm. renovation how did you learn how did you become as professional as you are in running your shop 
Well, I have a business degree and I did work in a, a very professional industry in lab diagnostics with doctors and hospitals and, and CEOs of hospitals and things like that. So I, I'd say that really trained me well to be able to interact with customers, you know, at all levels, whether it's kids, whether it's you know, all socioeconomic environments, because that's what I see in my shop, you know, people that are just wanting to buy a $2 card and people that are looking for the $7,500 investment. Um, so the professionalism has to stay the same. Uh, for two reasons. Also on top of that, number one is the buying aspect. Um, you know, I don't want to have a bad reputation in the way that I buy. You know, I'm very transparent with people that walk in with collections and I look through it and I'll tell them what I, you know, predict that it's worth, which I feel is accurate because integrity is important to me. And then I'll tell them what I can pay for it. Uh, a lot of people will just throw out a number and the people may, may or may not know if it's a good number or not. Right. Um, and the other part is, the world of the online marketplace, you know, a Google review means everything to me. And when you get a negative, it, it hurts, it stings. And if I'm not professional, if my employees aren't professional to my customers, we're going to deal with it. We're going to talk about it and we're going to either train to make it better the next time and stuff like that. So I think it's just in an innate behavior to be able to be that way now. And um, with the shop growing the way it has, I don't want to have a bad reputation that people get, you know, a little bit turned off by somebody not being professional with them. You know, we want to be friendly for you can be professional and friendly at the same time, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I mean, you, you um, keep in contact with some of your, your LCS fellow, fellow uh, owners. Yes. Um, do, do you guys share, like, I'm sure you guys share sort of like, Hey, what's this selling for? What are you buying that for? That kind of stuff. But do you guys also share any sort of best practices in running the shop? Like, do you get any tips from each other? Can you speak a little bit about that network that you're a part of? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll name names too, because I just, I, I thrive and really, you know, uh, I, I love these guys. I love all of them and they've been so helpful. And I feel like I've been the same to them too, kind of mentorish to some of the younger guys that have built card shops. But, um, you know, RBI crew, Ryan Bannister and Neil and, and Adam, the whole team over there, they're probably my closest, you know, partners, I would say. A lot of people are like, you guys are competing card shops, you know, you sell online and everything. Absolutely not. We are so working together to make sure we better the hobby in, in general and as a whole. Um, because we want to do things the right way. So we call each other. I mean, Ryan and I talk literally almost every day after work. You know, my wife hears my phone ring around 7 p.m. at the dinner table. And she's like, well, Ryan must be calling you. You know, it's just one of those things. And and I love it. Like we talk almost every night to recap our days. You know, what happened? Good, bad, ugly. What products did you sell? What do you need to move? You know, what prices are you at? Things like that. Um, so yeah, Ryan Bannister and RBI crew, Ryan Johnson, card collector too. Um, you know, I love it that I was able to help mentor him and get his shop started and really give him as much positive advice that I could to get that thing running. And that man's, he's a behemoth in this hobby now. And I love it. Right. And we, we, none of us really have any bad encounters with Ryan Johnson because he's such a friendly guy. Yeah. He's young, he's raw, but man, is that kid doing good things for the hobby? So um, Chad Weldon at sports card junction, you know, somebody who didn't have the business acumen that he you know needed to have to really get this shop, you know, off the ground and rolling from his dad, but he's grown. He's done such a good job building that thing up. Um, Louisville sports cards, you know, Kentucky basketball cards, Jimmy Mahan. If you don't know Jimmy Mahan, follow him on Instagram. He's one of the kindest, nicest, most genuine guys you'll ever meet. Uh, gosh, who else? I mean, several card shops that we just have a blast doing this stuff together. Um, you know, up in Canada, I've got Jeremy Lee. <laughs> that's about it i don't have anybody else in canada but i've got jeremy lee i, I mean you got three me. stars three star sports cards in minnesota we talk sometimes too but you know the ones that i mentioned at the beginning are the guys that we consistent Shamili pops i'm sorry i didn't mean to leave jameel out because jameel and i talk all the time too but um Mealy pops is part of that you know six to eight card shop group if you will that really uses uh each other that has the same goals, the same mindsets of how we want to succeed as a business and also take care of our customers. Cool, man. Okay. We got, we got questions, comments rolling in. I love it, everybody. So we're going to, we're going to get to it, to a few of them uh, right away here. Uh, Colin Murray says pricing is huge on the front of your cards. That's how you make money. Yes. I never understood putting your prices on the back. Um, Okay, I want to go on to right here. I want to I want to bring on Jeffrey Hart's question because it's interesting. Let's hear about the what you know the best collection that you purchased that came into the shop that you can think of right now. But then I want you to talk about 
what sort of autonomy do you give your staff to spend the shop, you know, your money as the owner of the store when you're not there? I always found yeah. that fascinating. You'll go into a shop and the person at the counter isn't allowed to do anything because the owner isn't there. And I, yeah. I understood that too. Yeah. When I owned a card shop, we could only buy when I was in the shop. When, when, yeah. when my mother was behind the counter, she wouldn't buy. She didn't know what she was doing. This is a, from this is in the early early nineties. Right. But I want. I'm curious about the autonomy your staff has, and uh, and then the question on the screen from Jeff Hart. So the autonomy question um, right now, since probably 2016, because of the trust and you know ex, you know dedication I know Jake has and the trust I have in him, he has full autonomy to buy anything without any budget, any limits. He could spend 20 grand today if he wanted to on a collection because I know he has our best interest at heart. And then I've got, you know, another employees, uh, two other employees that I allow them to buy. Um, they basically have like a limit. I tell them like, guys, if anything is at a thousand dollars or less to buy a collection that, you know, at least has a little bit of profitability and it's fair and it's something, you know, we can use go for it. Um, you know, and they're the ones that are comfortable. There's a few of them that still aren't comfortable buying because they're afraid they're going to make a decision that's wrong. And, and I'm trying to, you know, help educate them, train them, encourage them. Cause I really do keep people uh, empowered to kind of take ownership of this stuff. I mean, I've told them that I, I, I use those words every day, take ownership of what you're doing today, take ownership of this section of the shop, the pricing aspect. Um, so yeah, I a hundred percent. I mean, the autonomy is, it's an ever evolving situation and I am, you know, willing to let them buy something. And if they mess up, Hey, if, if it's not a $2,000 mess up, if it's a $200 mess up, I'm not going to be upset. You live yeah. and learn. Right. Um, but Jeff, Jeffrey's co collection question, 20 summer of 2014, when I didn't have a lot of money because I had really screwed up on ordering too much product and was losing money hand over fist, had the opportunity to buy what today, Jeffrey, I'm not kidding you, would probably be worth over a million dollars. Um, it was a Michael Jordan collection, still to this day, the best MJ collection I have ever seen. Every insert you can imagine. Eight FLIR rookies that were ungraded. Two star 101 rookies. Every refractor and under the sun. I mean, I kid you not, man. It was... I, I'll tell you what I bought the collection for because it's, it's such a cool story, but it, obviously it's an evolving story, right? I bought the collection for $75,000 in 2014. I did not have $75,000 in the shop, in, in the bank at all. So I literally drained everything I had in my savings account, personal savings, moved it over to the shop as a loan, if you will, used it. The guy wanted cash. I felt dirty. It was gross, but he wanted cash. So I had to go to the bank, have them pull everything out of my savings in the form of cash, gave it to him and bought this collection, loaded up two, no, three cars full, my wife's car, my car, and my in-law's car full of these Jordans. It had, it had a Michael Jordan 97, 98 finest gold embossed refractor number to 72. I think it was Jeremy. Is that right? It was graded a nine five. Um, it had the 96, 97 tops Chrome Michael Jordan refractor. It had a Kobe Bryant tops Chrome refractor rookie. It had, I mean, you name it, it had it. It had all the key inserts. It had the um, metal fusion titanium. It's numbered to 250. I mean, that card's gorgeous, right? Yeah. You name it, it had it in the collection. And I freaked out that I had spent every dime that I had in my business and my personal income. And I went to, I bought the collection in June of 14 and I took everything that was big to the national in Chicago in 2014 and sold it all. And I made $10,000. <laughs> I was so happy. Right. But yeah. I was like, I got to get, I got to get my money back. Got to get my money back. I sold it all for 10 and $10,000 profit. I have one item that I kept that's hanging in my basement. It's a signed dream team picture of Michael Jordan, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, upper deck authenticated, making this joke that Larry Bird made in the locker room. And it's the only piece I have left from that collection. But uh, that is the best by far biggest collection I've ever bought. And uh, today's value of that collection, I guarantee you is over a million dollars. Over for sure. For Way sure over. over. I mean, it yeah. could be several million dollars, but I'm trying to give you a conservative answer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I, I'm, I'm just, yeah. Okay. Let's keep going because we could think about that collection for, for hours and hours, <laughs> right? I still have pictures of the collection because I took oh. this like, I mean, there was unopened wax. Uh, it, it's, yeah, it's insane. 
Okay. All right. Joe says the professionalism is huge and attending to each and every human you interact with. Agreed. Yeah, for sure. Right. Don't, and you no, know, don't assume someone coming into the store isn't going to be a customer or, and don't, you know, pay respect to everybody. That's kind of the way any age, any gender, and no matter what they're wearing, how they look, well, you got to respect people when they come in the shop. I think that's probably something that you guys do uh, on a regular basis. Uh, we're going to look at the second half of this question. Uh, do you recommend any people that are you any people to do uh, vintage pack breaks, pack or box breaks? Uh, vintage Breaks on Instagram is a reputable company. They're probably one of the only I know that are doing vintage packs and boxes consistently. Um, uh, okay. That I'd, be, I'd say they're the only ones that I really could recommend because I'm not really knowledgeable of anybody else that consistently does vintage only breaks, Jim. And model car guy uh, is looking at expanding his model car store. Uh, he wants to know, do you see 80 to 90, 80s and 90s hockey staying hot? Now, I know you said to me the other day that hockey is a bit of a foreign language to you. So, yes, it is. but, but you do carry hockey and you're what you, yeah. you have your finger on the pulse of the market. So, what do you think? You know, 80s and 90s hockey has picked up lately, yeah. along with many other genres. Do you see it staying hot? It's hot, but it's still not a massive money maker. I mean, that kind of stuff, you know, you buy it for 20 and sell it for 30 kind of stuff. I mean, you're, you're going to have, I mean, you guys might have more OPG in Canada, which is going to be much more popular when it comes to the hockey market than the 80s and 90s tops and upper deck and, you know, whatever else was out there in hockey. But uh, it, it is hot and, I will, I, I could see it consistently staying that because I've told so many people that buying eighties and nineties, whatever sport it is, brings back so much nostalgia from those days. Yeah. Don't do it. You're not opening it to make any money. I promise you that you're doing it to bring back the memories of your childhood and spend 30 to 50 bucks for a box of cards. So I encourage it. If you can, if you can afford to do it and you have a great spot to add to it, go for it. Go for it. Sports card review. Uh, good evening to you. Uh, Sanderson to or says that, you know, I imagine obviously frustrating when someone comes into the shop to sell and they don't understand that as a business, you cannot pay full price. Is this in this current climate, is this happening more and more people coming in thinking they're, they have a, a lottery on their hands? Uh, mainly only on the graded stuff, Sanderson. Um, you know, people see PSA 10 prices and they think that, you know, I'm an investor and I have to pay full price. No, I, I'm going to pay strong. I'll pay you 85, 80 to 85% of market pricing because I can sell it at 95 to hundred percent. But, um, it's, it's only happening on the current ultra modern graded stuff. You know, other than that, no, everybody knows that they're selling it to me, that I'm going to pay them a fair price. They don't have to deal with online sales and they're going to get a nice lump sum and be able to walk out the door empty handed with a check in their hand. Cool. Terry Fortune says, what is the card that you purchase most often? <laughs> like a flag. single card? Oh, yeah, man. It, has know, to be the, it has to be the Jordan Fleer rookie because yeah. since people know that I'm such a Michael Jordan junkie myself, they, they kind of migrate to Indie Card Exchange whether it's online or in person, I currently own, I think nine MJ Flea rookies, but I flip them pretty quickly. You know, I've got the ones in my personal collection. I have a complete PSA nine Fleer set with stickers as a PC piece. Um, super excited about being able to put that together. Um, but no, it's it's got to be the Fleer Jordan. You know, it's the for most sure. exciting one too because I don't get tired of looking at it either. No, oh, it's a beautiful card for it sure. Sure is, yeah. AJ15, this is a good question too. Is there any way as a shop you can prevent buying stolen collections? Does it scare <laughs> you? And and how do you uh, how do you defend against that? AJ's full of good questions tonight. I like this. Did you hire him, Jeremy? No, I didn't. I did. <laughs> AJ, thanks for coming out tonight, buddy. Good job, Jeremy. I'm impressed. Uh, or AJ, sorry. Um, the answer is I do my best. Um, I, I ask a lot of questions because you can really get a sense if somebody's coming in trying to sell something that was stolen. Uh, I have two horrible stories, you know, that happened in the last seven years. I don't know if you want me to go into them, Jeremy or not, but no, you, you know, you can tell. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think it's interesting. It's good to know because this is, uh, yeah. You know, to other shop owners that are listening. I mean, you know, we, we, we can learn from your lessons. So I think yeah. it's, uh, yeah. So, uh, summer of 2015, this gentleman and three other guys came in and had a backpack full of stuff and it was all great vintage and it was nice stuff. Uh, they wanted to sell it. You know, his grandfather passed away and he was ready to sell his grandfather's cards. And, you know, I didn't get a good feeling about it. I really did not like the situation. It just felt 
not right. And, um, you know, they had like PSA eight Nolan Ryan rookie and they had a PSA seven 1957 tops mantle. I mean, they had a couple Aaron rookies, like really good stuff. <clears throat> and I'm just like, this isn't right. So I went back to the back of my shop and I had a guy who works back in the back. Um, and I said, can you look online? Will you just start talking, looking on the blowout chat forums and look on Google and anything that anything would pop up that something happened with a stolen collection. So he did. I mean, I was keeping these guys company and I'm looking at their cards for like 15 or 20 minutes. I go back to the back of the shop again. He's like, Andy, I don't find anything. I mean, I can't, I've talked to everybody because he knew a lot of people in the hobby too, because we have to look out for each other as card shops, you know? So that's my first part of the story, but I go back out there and I end up buying this part of this collection. Um, I'm like, if, if it's not stolen, I can't miss out on it because it's such good stuff. Right. So I spent, I mean, I probably spent 12 or $13,000 on some of this stuff in 2015 and everything was great. You know, I, I had the collection, nothing happened. Two weeks go by. I had sold a couple cards to a, co a customer of mine. That customer took one of the cards and put it on eBay to sell it. When that card went on eBay, a message came through and it was a detective saying, where did you obtain this card? And he said, I bought it from Indy Card Exchange in Indianapolis, Indiana. So the detective then called me. Lo and behold, that entire collection was stolen. The gentleman that owned the collection was robbed at gunpoint in like the suburbs of Chicago. They knew who the guy was to, to steal from. They had this entire operation set up to rob him. It was horrible. I was one of nine card shops that these guys went around to, to sell the collection, including like baseball card exchange in Sherryville, Indiana, you know, really good, reputable card shops. You know, I'm telling you the long part of the story. Um, so what happened was we had to testify that we did buy some cards from this person because they had a, um, a hint of who it would be. Um, I was able to thankfully not sell a lot of the stuff. 10 of the best cards I'm like, used as I'm thinking it's an investment. I'm going to hang on to these things long-term. Well, the good news is I didn't sell them and I was able to give them back to the rightful owner. Uh, long story short, those guys thankfully were arrested. All four of them got arrested. The The mastermind behind the whole thing, it, I think he's still in jail. He, served, he has to serve nine years in jail and uh, was glad to be able to put him behind bars and, and at least get some of those cards back in the hands of the rightful owner. But it was, it was a tough situation. It put me on pins and needles for months, if not years wow. about, wondering if collections are stolen. Did so. you, did you get your money back that you paid for those cards? No. Cause I did sell a few of the cards and the detective said, you know, Andy, you rightfully sold those cards. You didn't think they were stolen. You didn't know anything. Um, of the 12,000, I ended up losing about $3,500 from the whole thing. And it was, you know, it was okay to me to at least know that some of these cards got back into that owner's hands and stuff. Cause that poor guy, I mean, it was, it was traumatizing to him, but, uh, yeah. That was one story. And then the most recent story was uh, New Heart Cards in Columbus, Ohio had a 1952 Tops Mantle stolen. I don't know if you ever saw that on social media, Jeremy, but it was a PSA 152 Tops Mantle. This one's a fun little sting operation. Um, the, the thief, they posted all over social media that the card had been stolen. It was a 2 a.m. smash and grab, broke in the front window, took the card, didn't take anything else from the shop, and left, right? Three days later, we get a phone call random phone call at the card shop and saying, Hey, I've got a card I'm interested in selling. Would you guys be interested? I'm like, sure. What is it? 1952 tops, Mickey Mantle, PSA one. I'm like, this is, this is weird. I'm like, sure. Bring it in. So the guy comes in shady's looking as all get out. So, you know, you walk, he walks in and I'm like this guy, who is this guy? <laughs> this guy. <laughs> so he, Oh, I, I look at the card and I positioned myself in my shop because I've got cameras everywhere in the old shop too. I positioned myself in the shop holding the card out like this so that it would be seen over my shoulder from the camera in the ceiling that I'm holding this 52 tops mantle dead nuts. It's the right one, right? It is the one that was stolen in Columbus, Ohio, three days prior. We all had the picture of the card still in its PSA slab with a unique serial number identifier. And what happened was, is the guy wanted 12,000 bucks. I said, man, that's just too expensive for me. I had no intention of buying it. Right. He, He's like, you sure you don't want it? What about 10,000? I'm like, no, I, I said, that's just too much money for me. I can't buy the thing. I said, but I'll tell you what, I know another card shop in Indianapolis you could go to that might want to look at it. He goes, okay, thanks, man. Where's it at? So I gave him the address of this card shop. Card shop's all the way on the other side of town. It's about a 30-minute drive. 
In that 30 minutes, I called the detective in Columbus, Ohio, called the card shop in Columbus, Ohio, and told them that I found their card and that this guy's on his way to another card shop. They call the other card shop. They Jamie, the owner of the other card shop, who I know and who I respect, helps the I, uh, Indianapolis Police Department set up an operation. They have the place surrounded. This dude, of course, dumb as a box of rocks, goes <laughs> into the shop, shows the 52 mantle to Jamie. Police converge onto the shop. Guys arrested. Newhart gets their card back. It was the coolest story ever. So That's great. yeah, it was. It's fun. So I mean, we're all looking out for each other. But yeah, the the theft is is real. You know, my friend Jimmy Mahan just got robbed um, in the middle of the night. Uh, Kentucky basketball cards just got Saw robbed. That. Yeah, it's just I hate it. You know, but it's also realistic. You know, we have. I feel like we have Fort Knox in this place that we just built. You know, we've got security everywhere, cameras everywhere. Um, it's just nuts, but it's the nature of the industry. Yeah, you need to invest in in that security, and that's that stuff isn't cheap. The camera systems and no. the security and all that. So, but it's a necessary uh, necessary precaution these days for sure. Just with what sure. this stuff is worth. So, uh, I want to welcome Steve Sir to the show. Steve, great to have you. Better late than never for sure. Uh, Congratulations fire, on the win. Yeah, fire sports cards. I feel Andy's pain on selling the Jordan collection early. I sold so many cards back in the day that I totally regret. Yeah. AJ15, you're welcome, man. You earned it. You certainly earned it sure. tonight. Card Collector 1982 has been to RBI Crew, talked with Ryan a couple times. Super nice guy and fantastic shop. Sounds like one I need to put on my list of places to stop by. Most when I can do that as well. And Hockey Hockey, glad to see the losers stealing those collections were put in jail. It, it yes. really does hurt. They not. I mean, you, you're, you're okay with it, but even to lose $3,500, it, 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 you know, it just seems unfair to me, but it is what it is. I guess you yeah. can't do much. And the, <clears throat> especially since you did some quick due diligence in the time that guy was in the shop to find out if you could find anything out about that particular collection. In any yeah. event, Jeremy Pringle says awesome stories. Andy, I really like the community you're helping to build. Thank you. And Sanderson to Orr says, all you need is a hungry pit bull for some security, Andy. <laughs> the dog, right? That's what I, you know, that's the nice thing about card shows. At the end of the night at card shows, there's usually some police dogs running around the. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> at the, at the uh, facility so good stuff okay well i needed them at the uh, i needed them at the chicago national in 2019 too jeremy Did you know i had a case of national treasures football stolen from my booth too right i don't know if you knew that i i did not uh, know that i do remember seeing this big kerfuffle when somebody was running through and there were yeah. a bunch of people chasing him was that might have been your that it that incident it, it, there was an incident that that was another theft of single cards that had been stolen from our little bargain boxes we had on the side. But the case of NT was behind us and behind us. If you remember, we were in the very back of the yeah. convention center. There was an open space that people could hang out and somebody had distracted us and literally came from behind and just reached through and grabbed a case of NT football from us. Did you find how, when did you realize it was gone? Uh, later that night. Uh, we were packing everything back up into the lock boxes and stuff, the lock bags. And I said, guys, where's the NT box? Um, like, I didn't take it. I didn't sell it. I'm like, oh, no. So um, had to file insurance on that. They could never, they didn't have cameras that were on that area of the convention center. Of course, I was in that spot, but uh, insurance took care of it. Did the, well, that's good to hear. But did the national promoters, uh, did, you know, do you think that they're going to be, better securitized moving forward with cameras on every, especially they kind of have to be now with the value. Yeah. I mean, since the last, since the national in 2019 to the next one, yeah. everything in that room has gone up in value yes. up to 10 times. Like they're going to have to think more about security now. Do you agree? hundred yeah. percent. If they don't, they're missing out and they're going to have to relocate to another place because the Chicago place was just not a great atmosphere and, and thieves knew it. I mean, thieves were thriving on that stuff. There, there were so many thefts at that national, but, uh, I think if they don't, and we, I'm going to bring somebody to maybe like we'll hire between myself and RBI crew, MC sports cards. Cause we were all set up in that same little quadrant area. Yeah. We'll hire somebody to just be full-time security for us. Yeah, no, smart, smart for sure. It's okay. Expensive. Yeah. Hot. <laughs> What's that? I said, it's expensive, but smart, right? But, but probably worthwhile. I mean, yeah. you know, that's what it's coming to these days. Hockey, hockey, uh, Jeremy, any horror stories from your time of owning a card shop? We got broken into once. Um, they smashed our, our showcases and took some singles. I, I don't remember the details anymore. It is literally 30 years ago that I had a card <laughs> shop. Gosh, I can't believe that. It was 91 to 94. So what is that? That's almost 30 years ago. If not, yeah. Oh, boy. 
Okay. <laughs> let's, let's, let's keep on going. Um, Bobby Burrell says, wow, great stories. Play dumb games, win stupid prizes. Yeah. <laughs> Hampton Sports, do you think the new retail limitations be better for the growing business? Um, we're just not going to get into retail tonight, but Hampton, thank you for joining in the question. Uh, be, I wanted to come up here uh, to AJ, another another AJ15. I mean, because this ties into something we were going to get to anyway in terms of, you know, the how the hobby is right now. So why don't you just take the question as it's written? What excites you about the hobby right now, Andy? The new people entering the business, into the hobby um, that, that are excited about it. You know, not just about one product or one sport. I mean, they're just excited about being back in it or hearing that it's fun to be a part of getting more kids involved. Um, just let, let's talk a numbers thing. I'm, I'm a very quantifiable numbers person, right? We moved to this new shop on average. We were bringing in about 50 to 75 transactions a day at the old shop on a Saturday, which was a very, very busy day for a seven, eight hour shop. We are averaging over 210 transactions per day in the new shop on a Saturday. Again, it just tells you the people are, are interested. They see the excitement and then they have an atmosphere. So it tells me that the hobby's flourishing. Um, we do a lot of kid-friendly stuff. You know, Before COVID, we had a kid's club and we had about 500 kids signed up in our kids club where they would get a free gift from us once a month, whether it was a pack of top loaders, which are now like $600 a pack or something like that. <laughs> um, you know, stuff like that. It, it's, uh, it, it's just about getting the kids involved and about having more people either re-enter the scene, knowing that it's a fun business uh, and hobby or seeing new faces every day. I really almost see new faces almost every day. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, 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 that's just cool. I wonder, you know, when you talk about 210 transactions, I mean, I know myself, I've been in a card shop and I'll do one transaction and then I'll 20 minutes later, I'll do another transaction. <laughs> and then, you know, maybe half an hour later, I'll do another transaction. Sure. That's true. Does that, yeah. you know, does that happen quite a bit in the store? Cause, because, and this is a great segue into a bit of a store tour and talking about the bar that you're sitting at a bar right now, you're sitting at the Jordan bar, so, yeah. which if people don't follow you on Instagram or wherever else, they may not be familiar with just what went into building out your new location. Sure. So maybe, maybe now is a good time to a couple of things. The question I just posed about yeah. repeat transactions per visit. Mm -hmm. um, and also the, the, the to the extent you encourage your customers to stick around don't just come by and leave come and hang out yeah. uh as as joe said earlier the the lcs's are the hub of the hobby do you encourage people to stick around and if so do you you're nodding so that's a yes, yes. and do you in actually let's just get this why don't you show us the the, the jordan bar that you're sitting at tell okay. us the story behind this this piece of history that i think you've built and then maybe give us a quick tour of the store Sounds good. All right. Let me see if I can get this switched around. So and Jeffrey Hart this. has asked, how much are all the cards in the Jordan bar worth? So uh, we Jeffrey. So Jeremy, can I switch it to a different mode at all? I, that's what I have to ask real quick when I go to the I'm cam. not sure, actually, if you can right. switch your Here's what I can around. do for everybody. I'll just show them the Jordan bar. Here we go. So um, this is a 1,000 Michael Jordan cards. Exactly on top of the bar. So what I did was I literally took the Jordan cards that I had purchased over the years and just kind of created like a four row monster box of MJ cards and little by little, just kind of threw a few more in there. Um, sorry, we got a bunch of top loaders sitting on top of the bar right now, but oh, that's where all is, the top loaders are. Yeah, they're right. And Indy card exchange took them all. <laughs> uh, the bar is 16 feet long and five feet deep and goes back to the wall right there. But the measurements, and again, I didn't know this, but the measurements actually turned out to be a thousand exact Michael Jordan cards. So I'm using my little stand for the uh, phone right here as my camera. But, you know, I, I hate not having to be able to good uh, video can here you, because I can't flip it. But can you pan out? Can you take a step away from there and yeah. give us the the the, the wide sure. angle view of the bar and the wall yeah. behind it with all the wax, so yeah. we can get a good idea just of how big that thing is? And so there's the bar, and okay. there's our wax wall and all the chairs. We have eight chairs around the bar. Uh, it's a perfect setup. And then uh, again, the Jordan cards, and then that lit uh, brick underneath. There's some cool LED lighting that's up underneath the lip of the front of the bar. 
and it goes down into that brick. And that brick is really sentimental to me as much as those Jordan cards are. Those bricks are original bricks from the night, uh, from the Notre Dame stadium in South Bend, Indiana. They got remodeled in 1996. So we have a little tribute to that brick. If you guys go down here, you'll be able to see over on the wall that uh, we put it, it says it's a piece of the house that Rockney built. So anybody that knows Newt Rockney, Notre Dame, the history, and then the locker room when they walk out has a big sign that says play like a champion. And all the players smack the old play like a champion sign. And then it comes over here against the wall where the Indy Card Exchange logo is, if you guys can see that, that's uh, also Notre Dame brick that was basically inset into the wall and with some little reclaimed wood on the wall. And then this little bad boy that's, uh, sorry, let me get that. There we go. A certificate of authenticity from the University of Notre Dame that that brick is authentic. So it's kind of fun to be able to have that and to be able to brag about it. Yeah. And show everybody. I'll pan back out so you guys can see that reclaimed wood wall. It's kind of a feature wall for us that we're taking pictures all the time with cards and people wanting to be back there. So yeah, there you go. Uh, it's just a cool atmosphere, but yeah, about 2,100 square feet here in the front of the shop. And then if you go down where those jerseys are, we have all of our, gosh, this is hard having to do it backwards, isn't it? <laughs> I wish I could great. switch to Kim. So we have all our display cases with all of our cards. So this, this case right here, Jeremy, you'd be proud of me oh, all okay. the way down at the bottom. Oh, is our fun. hockey stuff. <laughs> Let's see if I can get some hockey stuff in there. So we've got a lot of Blackhawks stuff because Chicago Blackhawks are the team that everybody wants. We have a ton of soccer cards because soccer is so popular right now. We've got the basketball cards over here. This is all your ultra modern basketball in this case here. This is what I call the goat corner. All MJ, Kobe, and LeBron, and then a few Steph Currys on top. So a lot of good stuff, right? I picked out a few cards you can look at too, Jeremy, if you want to. This cool. is our baseball section here. This whole display case is modern and uh, a little bit older baseball, football, whole display case. And then we dedicated three display cases to vintage baseball, basketball, and football. I don't know if this camera angle is looking good for you guys or not. Yeah, but. it's fine. No, you, you, you're doing great. It, a little it, bit of vintage all the way down. And then you've got the junk wax. So I don't know who asked me that question earlier, but, you know, the guy that was trying to do junk wax at the model – car store so yeah um we even have look at this guys junk hockey there you go all right 1990 <laughs> score 1990 upper deck and 1994 power play so there you have it very cool man appreciate yeah. appreciate the tour no problem sure. it feels to me like steph curry is working his way into that uh the, you know the the goat plural discussion with uh with mj kobe and lebron i don't know I, just, uh, the guy's the kid. The guy's a, the guy's just a, a monster. Yes, he is. He's, he's was, transcended the game. I mean, I, I talked about him today with a customer. I said, you have no idea. Steph Curry has changed the game of basketball, and you can only put about five other players in the history of basketball that have done that, right? Wilt Chamberlain, Bill Russell, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Kevin Durant, and Steph Curry. Because Kevin Durant's the best shooting you know, seven-footer I've ever seen in my entire life. There's no question. Yeah. No so it's just cool. Like he, Steph Curry is on that same level as those guys for sure. Yeah. Okay. We're going to go to some comments. Thank you for the tour. That was, My that's pleasure. awesome. I love the, the feature pieces, the bar, the, the wall. Those are just gorgeous. Yes. Uh, Sanderson says you should, you should set up GoPros to record everything during the show. I mean, not a, not a bad idea, actually. Good idea. Yeah. Uh, Zaw says, do you have Kevin Durant and Harden stuff selling a lot because of the Nets team this season? Yes, we do. And I invested heavily in Kevin Durant a few years ago, just thinking that this guy has the chance to be a mega superstar. And thankfully it paid off. I mean, I owned about 12 PSA 10 tops Chrome rookies and five or six Chrome refractor PSA 10s and stuff. But Harden never sells very well. Kevin no. Durant does. Harden just doesn't have hobby love because I call, I mean, you've got good players, but you also have hobby love that has to go with good players and he doesn't get that at all. So he doesn't sell in here either. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Uh, Jeffrey Hart, how much are all the cards in the Jordan bar worth? Do you have a... Oh. So... And, well, hold on. <laughs> Let me just preface this by saying, right now they're probably worth a, all about a zero, right? Because they're... Big old goose egg. Right now. Every, 
Every single card Jeffrey got glued with Gorilla Glue spray on the back of it, slapped down at the bottom, um, you know, onto the card bar. I only had a few seconds belt while it was tacky for it to be able to dry. And then we poured, you know, clear epoxy over the top. So there's about a half inch to an inch thick epoxy over the top of those cards too. So they are completely ruined. Um, <laughs> the value of them, I never tried to add it up. So a few people tried to do it, you know, looking at cards and just taking an average value. I mean, there's a beam team Jordan. I don't know if you guys want to see it. I mean, there's a, like, there's a, a beam team, Michael Jordan right there, right? That's a two or $300 card ungraded. Um, the one that I regret the most is this one right here, this, this record collection, Michael Jordan. Um, I thought that that card actually was a card from a box set that you get for like 1999 at Walmart and target. It's actually a really tough insert that I just had a bonehead decision that I put it in there. A PSA 10 of that card sells for like $3,000 and it, there was nothing wrong with that card. It was absolutely flawless. And I just slapped it on there with glue and <laughs> put it on the Jordan bar. Uh, so if we had this, let's, let's say that that card's worth 300 bucks. I mean, I estimated value of 15,000 bucks. Jeremy, you were telling me the other night you think it's worth a whole lot more than that, but I don't know. I, I mean, don't. yeah. Some people say more. Some people say less. You know, there's also your $3 Michael Jordan cards, but it's it's not about the money to me. It's about having a destination um, place to come to and something to see. And you can say you got to see the, the Michael Jordan bar at the Indy Card Exchange. And I think that it is, it is that sort of thing that's going to bring people to the shop, you know, you know, and it could even bring people to Indianapolis, you know, and it'll, it'll bring, well, you'll bring me there. Not so much the Jordan bar, <laughs> but I can, it is, it's something that, you know, it's kind of like who else has done that? Who else has something like that in their shop that is that cool and that hobby centric. I, I just think it's a great piece and I hope Thank it you. lasts for a hundred years uh, where it is. So Thank you. I hope so too. Cool, man. There really have been cool. people that have come from all over the Midwest to see it. I mean, I had a, I had a couple yeah. from Chicago. They're like, we follow you on Instagram. We wanted to come down to Indy and my husband had some work thing to do. So I wanted to come with him and see your Jordan bar. It was just, it just yeah. makes you feel good, right? It's awesome. I'm not surprised at all. Uh, Jim says, do you need a drink coaster when you drink at that bar? <laughs> we don't allow extreme hot stuff and extreme cold stuff on it. So no coasters. It's okay, Jim. But uh, like I'm drinking my bottle of water. You can have that stuff on, on, on the Jordan bar. That epoxy is rock hard. I mean, I don't yeah. know if you guys have ever dealt in epoxy. Uh, when I did that video, I was holding two spatulas and gloves and everything. I looked like a big old nerd. And we had to spread the epoxy out because it hardens within like 10 to 12 minutes. And you have to then spread it out, let it self-level, and then you have to pour like or um, shoot a, like a heat gun on top of it because the bubbles rise from the like underneath the cards and underneath the uh, epoxy, and the, all the bubbles have to pop before it hardens. So, thankfully, I hired a professional and I helped him out by laying the epoxy. But it was kind of a nerve-wracking experience because you couldn't really do this one over. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a one and done for sure. <laughs> Uh, just like the rest of us, Toa says it's the most beautiful bar I've ever seen. Thank you, Toa. Terry loves the setup and the tour of your shop. I did too. Very awesome. Daniel, amazing bar. I saw the clip of how you made it. So cool. As did I. That was really cool. Um, Colin says that the Toronto Expo has cameras set up. That's great. I didn't even really realize. I knew there were dogs. I didn't know there were cameras <laughs> set up. That's great to know. Uh, Lucky, what is, what is the percentage of sales of raw cards versus graded i'm assuming that question is to you and your shop do you have a quick answer yeah, for that andy it's a good question i'd say it's uh probably 60 percent graded 40 percent raw because vintage is mainly raw because we sell a lot of cards in the 50 to 200 dollar price range that aren't worth getting graded but uh it's probably 60 40 graded versus ungraded now because we still sell a lot of modern stuff that's graded Sanderson says, Andy, by law, don't you have to have a Larry Bird wing in your shop there in Indiana? I love that. That's pretty we, funny. We carry that, that jersey framing section back there. We've had about six to eight Larry Bird jerseys on the wall in the last couple of years, and every single one of them has sold Sanderson. So we try, but Larry Legend is definitely a piece of us around Indiana for sure. For sure. Rocco says, uh, and you need more hockey. Gretzky started his pro career with the Indianapolis Racers. Should be more hockey fans in Indy. Yeah, that's right. But, 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 he, wonder, but he left. He left us, Rocco. I mean, it, just because he's the greatest of all time doesn't mean you have to leave Indianapolis at a <laughs> semi-professional hockey team to go play in the NHL, right? Hockey guy wants to know what is your favorite Jordan card of all time. Can I show you? Yeah, let's let's. That's a great. Yeah, let's go into. You got some cards to show. 
So I did bring my uh, – I told you guys a story if you've ever actually watched the uh, entire hour and 40 minutes of our show, but the 1988 Fleer, Michael Jordan, value aside, these three are my favorite cards of all time because these are the three cards that I pulled from that box on Christmas morning when I was 10 years old. And I've never even graded them because I don't care about the value. I just care about the fact that I still have them. So it almost tears me up thinking about it because it's the coolest thing ever. Um, I have the Jordan all-star and I have two of the base cards and I, I did bring in, I had a Reggie Miller rookie too, that came with it. So being a Pacer fan, you know, being in Indianapolis, I still have those four original cards. Uh, my brother stole all the Scotty Pippins from me because he liked Scotty Pippin better. So he always says that uh, I stole the Jordans from him, which is not true. I pulled those two Jordan cards, but uh, yeah, those are the, those are the best cards. And I still have the two original 88 Fleer Jordans right there. So did good your, question, hockey guy. Did your brother get the Stockton rookie in his pack in his packs? <laughs> well, I only cared about Jordan. So I didn't, I don't remember what happened to Stockton's and everything. The Stockton's <laughs> and the Dennis Rodman's he loved Dennis Rodman. He took every Dennis Rodman that we pulled. Normally you pulled like two or three of every player out of a box. So I know that I didn't have any Dennis Rodman's left because they were all in his possession. Right on. Uh, Toa says the cards might be worth nothing now, but that bar as an art and installation piece is cha-ching. I completely agree. <laughs> no doubt about it. Tristan Lee says Andy's one of the best and most trusted in the hobby. That's really nice. Tristan. Tristan. Hey, buddy. Yeah, it's nice to hear from Tristan. Love Good that evening, guy. Tristan. Logo, Logo Man Shark on Instagram. He's oh, the man. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Sports card seller says hello to us. Welcome to the show. Better late than never to anyone who's joined us uh, recently. Guys, uh, I'll just quickly put up uh, Andy's. If you don't aren't aware already where to follow the Indie Card Exchange on Instagram, there's their website. And I'm just going to throw out two. If you are new to this channel, to watching Sports Cards Live, I do want to welcome you guys tonight. I want to thank Andy for bringing more viewers to the show. Andy, thank you for letting people know you'd be on. And if I you are new, you. please throw a subscribe out there to the channel. I greatly appreciate it. Hit the thumbs up, all those things that help that YouTube algorithm that I don't understand how it works, but people seem to ask for, so it must mean something. Thank you very much. Uh, but please do subscribe to the channel. That I do greatly appreciate. Uh, Valentini Kitchens. Oh, now that's why he has his last name is Kitchens. He is a kitchen guy. Uh, says, you gave me a great idea for my future clients that want their home bars for their man caves. Thanks, Andy. That's no doubt. That's yeah. I, I hope that there's a ton of bars with cards on top just because of what we did. I think it'd be great. For sure. For sure. Um, and oh, so, uh, Jeff says, oh, what is your favorite Jordan insert? So you showed your favorite Jordan cards. What's your favorite? I mean, you know, your Jordan inserts. And yes. what's your favorite one? Uh, favorite one, regardless of value. So Jeremy, I, we got so busy at the card shop. I didn't get to go to the bank and get all my good stuff, unfortunately. So I have another burner phone that we use in the card shop for our social media. And I have pictures of all my Jordans. So that is my favorite Jordan insert of all time right there. It's called the yeah. Flare Showcase Hot Shots. Um, I, I remember pulling two of these as a you know 16 year old kid and, and I own that one that's in my you know safety deposit box but absolutely love that card I mean the fire the the basketball you know the pose that Jordan's doing going up for you know like a one-handed runner kind of thing I just I, I've always loved the look of that card uh, I dude I love it too I own a copy myself it's uh it's probably in my top three or four. Jordan cards in my collection. Absolutely yeah. love it. Uh, and they did them in hockey in 2012 Fleer Retro. Yes. You know, the Jor the Gretzky, the Crosby. They're and they're they look almost the exact same. They're very, they're just beautiful. Yeah. Love it as well. Uh Zal wants to know, do you have any Kobe cards to show? Um, I mean, I can show you stuff that's in the in my PC if you guys want to see them. I have some really good Kobe inserts that yeah, I collect because I collected Jordan and Kobe inserts. Um, I can show you this one. You guys would like this because so I own, it's the, uh, flare, the I'm sorry, the East West tops Chrome refractor. I own that in a PSA 10 and then the mystery finest refractor of Jordan. And the cool part about this card is look who's on the backside. You got Kobe on the backside of both of the cards, right? Right. So I have that card in a nine five for the mystery finest and the Kobe 10. Uh, let's see really quick. I'm not gonna, I know dead oh, time's well, a bad thing, right? So, uh, while you're, Tell I have us the Dunkin' Donuts BGS 10 Kobe. Mm. And competitive advantage. I have advantage. the competitive advantage PSA 10. Uh, let's see. There's the Court Masters PSA 10 and the Planet Metal PSA 10 Kobe. So those are just a couple. But yeah, I've got LeBron. a lot of good Kobe's too. 
So Zah, yes, he does have some great Kobe. <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up pretty soon here because we are running out of time. We have after hours starting in about fifteen minutes. A brand new okay. a brand new broadcast on the same YouTube channel here at Sports Cards Live. So be sure to check that out. Joe Pro will be joining. But let's go through a few more things here. Lucky K uh, wants to know, Andy, with the rise of Pokemon, is that a big part of your business now? The unopened boxes and packs are. We have decided not to have singles because we don't know enough about the industry yet. Um, we probably will eventually, but we cannot keep unopened boxes, like elite trainer boxes, booster boxes, You know everything that Pokemon offers, we try to carry. We only get a limited supply, but yes, it's, a, it's, it's not a big part of my business, but it's a consensus, consistent seller every time okay criminal mind wants to know is it true that card shop owners exploit people's lack of knowledge and take their cards for a fraction of the price all right that's a good question um it, you're generalizing things criminal mind the answer for me personally i can only answer to myself the answer is an emphatic no um, I don't know if you were on earlier i was telling people the best way to handle buying collections in my opinion is to let people know what they have and what the value is based on the condition they have. Cause you know, I deal with that when it comes to the vintage stuff and, and I really feel comfortable because I can assess a card and, and be within a grade point, you know, half a point here, a point there of what the card's going to be graded at knowing its authenticity. Um, you know, I've heard those bad stories as well that people have exploited people and taken advantage of them. Um, I can tell you emphatically that it doesn't happen at the Indy card exchange. Great. And, you know, I wouldn't have you on this show if I felt that it would be any different with you. So um, you've got my endorsement on that as well. Dennis Lescombe Sr. says, I so love the bar and your story, Andy. That's really nice. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis, for sure. AJ15, do you limit <clears throat> purchases like retail stores do or can people buy as many boxes as they want? Man, this guy, I'm going to, Jeremy, get his address. I'm going to send him a hat because this, the questions Dude, this guy has. You can't send anybody a hat until you send me a hat. All right. I'll send you a hat too. Got it. It's coming. I'll send you two. AJ, I don't know if you're in the US or in Canada, but you know, message Jeremy. I want to take care of you. That, these questions have been fantastic from this guy. Um, we do limit purchases. So we send out a weekly email newsletter to all of our customers who subscribe to our newsletter through our website on Mondays um, for all the new releases that are going coming out that week. The reason we limit it because our pricing is very competitive. We're well below market rates of, um, you know, Bowman baseball came out, right? And we were about 10 to 15% under what the current market was at across the board anywhere and everywhere. So we let people only have six boxes. Um, so yes, we do limit our purchases because we have such demand and we want to make sure that, that most people are getting a piece of the pie. Awesome. Okay. Uh, he does want a hat. He is in Canada. So you can okay. maybe send I'm sending you two, Jeremy. All right. One's going to AJ. We need to, we need to cover up that head of yours up there. It's too <laughs> Lucky says, thank you for your time. I live in Cincy and will definitely make the trip soon. Awesome. That's, that, that's great to hear. Um, and uh, hockey, hockey, do you worry about NFTs taking away from your business? I ask a lot of people that question hockey, hockey. I, I'm still, the jury's still out. I really hope and pray that doesn't happen. Um, I don't think it will because if you're a collector and investor, you want to hold something tangible and NFTs don't provide that for you, right? You don't get to hold something tangible. You can't hold a, a Reggie Miller rookie card in your hand. Um, maybe, maybe, but again, we're the dinosaurs of the industry um, and people that are walking into my shop are the ones that want to spend the money and actually walk out with something in their hands. Yeah. I agree. I don't, I don't, I think that it's a whole different thing, right? Cards are cards, NFTs are whatever they, they are. Yeah. So I don't, I don't see it being that much of a, I hope, I hope it does the reverse. I hope it brings more people into the card market. Yeah. And, it easily, and it quite easily could too, right? Okay. We are going to, uh, first, before we continue, I want to let everybody know next Saturday on the show, May the 8th, Dave Slipka will be joining uh, Industry Insiders, worked for many companies, a consultant. He's going to have a lot of insights for us. May 15th, DJ Ski will be our guest on Sports Cards Live. And then May 22nd, Jeff Morris, another Industry Insider. He's worked with many companies, including Pacific Trading Cards, among others. Looking forward to having these three episodes come up in the future. And we even have more coming. We are booked right through the end of June at this point, everybody. So the shows are keeping on coming. We're going to take a minute now and we are going to do the PC card of the day. I'm going to show two cards from my personal collection. 
These are cards, uh, you know, I like them to tie in to the guest uh, that we have for the evening. And it just makes sense that I show cards that I bought from Andy at the <laughs> last national. So, I'm, and I'm going to show them in the order I bought them. The first card I bought from you, Andy, was this guy right here. It's the 97 Metal Universe uh, base, Michael Jordan in a PSA 9. Nice. What did you get nice. that for? What did I pay you for it? Yeah. Oh couple gosh, hundred bucks maybe. A couple hundred bucks probably. Yeah. It wasn't uh, two thirty maybe. Two thirty rings right. a bell. Yeah, I yeah. probably had a marked at two fifty or two seventy five, and you beat me down, right? I beat you down for sure, man. <laughs> but look at that. You can see the texture in this card. It's pretty. This is the I base got... of the precious metal gems that are all the rage. I got that graded myself too because I bought that raw in a collection. I remember that. Yeah, and then the second card I bought from you. I remember exactly what I paid for this card was the uh, 2012 Panini Prism PSA 10 base uh, Kawhi Leonard rookie card. Nice. What did you these worth now? Uh, I think they're a few thousand, right? 3,000 maybe? Yeah, and somewhere in there, two to three. So they, yeah. they fluctuate here and there. Do you, do you remember what I paid you for this? Uh, what, 300 bucks maybe? 290. 280 290. 290. All right. You beat me yeah. down again. I wanted 300. I still want that $10 back, Jeremy. I, I probably used the line. Come on, man. Buy me a cup of coffee. I, mean, I came all the way down from Canada. <laughs> you did. You used the Canada line. I do remember that. Hey, it I'm works, Canadian. Right? I'm Canadian. Hey, eh? be nice to me. Be nice, eh? Be nice. Be nice. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Oh, Jeffrey Hart almost bought one tonight. Uh, the Ka the Kauai okay. worth two grand right now. All right. All Not right. bad. Good I'll stuff. take it. I mean, hey, uh, I could have bought any. The biggest, the biggest regret I have from that national was not buying your PSA nine Michael Jordan, row zero, I believe it was numbered out of two hundred and fifty. Yeah, a beautiful Very card. Showcase. You wanted like fifteen hundred dollars for it. I wanted to pay like thirteen. I ended up buying something different, uh, and uh, now that's a fifteen thousand dollar card. <laughs> yeah. It is. Add a zero to it for sure. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, man. Uh, Ryan O'Hara, Jordan Mental Universe will be my first basketball card ever on the lookout. Well, good luck to you, Ryan. It is a beautiful card. I, I can look yes, at this card quite a bit. The colors are just the colors, the design, the image, just magnificent all around. Agreed. All right, Andy, man, listen, I mean, we're going to uh, I think we're going to wrap it up. We didn't get to do the Sports Cars Live 5, but that's OK. We'll okay. do it next time we have you on, maybe which will be a year from now on the 10th anniversary. We'll do a Hey, man, we'll try to do a live episode of the show on location at the Indy Card Exchange from the Jordan Bar one year from now today, unless there's a live expo in Toronto that day, which I would have to be at. But if not, okay. I will be at your I will try to come to your shop. For I'm, sure. I'm going to hold you to that. I'd love to have you in town. I'll take you. I'll take you out and we'll have a nice little cookout at the house and and would love to talk, talk shop and talk to hobby and. Bring the Sound, family with you. Bring the family with you, Jeremy. We'll have some fun. Um, sounds good, man. So, tonight, my daughter is on her first sleepover at my parents' house for the. She's four years old, so wow. um, so it's kind of like nice and quiet. It's gonna be nice. It's gonna be nice and quiet in the morning tomorrow when when I wake up for I sure. Bet. Be easier on my wife as well, no doubt. Okay, man. Well, listen, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. I want thanks for thanks for coming on. Thanks for spending time with me the other night as well. Uh, it's been great, great to hang out with you uh, for these hours. It's one of the best parts of what I do with this show is getting to know people even better than I did before or getting to know them from scratch. So this has been awesome. Um, to the everyone in chat, thank you for joining us. Thank you for sticking around. We've had great viewership tonight, Andy. Uh, awesome. I want it. So thanks again for keeping it interesting. The stories you told were awesome. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. To the I chat, guess. get in your final comments. Let them, let her rip, let them rip. We're going to end the show in a couple minutes here. And again, we're going to have after hours in a few minutes, uh, in about five or six minutes, maybe five minutes late with Joe Perot. And if you're on Clubhouse, I'm going to open up a Clubhouse room after, after, after hours. And we're going to be in there chatting. And I, I'm, we're going to have a couple of topics. I want to, I want to hear about people's, uh, people's thoughts on, on their own LCSs and and what they've seen and you know the good stories they have from them and even some of the bad stories if you want. So that's what I want to talk about on Clubhouse later on. But um, again, Andy, thank you so much. We have some thank yous coming in, so let's go through these quick. AJ wants to say thanks. Andy, Adam Holgate, great interview. Thank you, Adam, very much. Valentini, you guys are awesome. Great, great show. Hope to meet you both one day. Same here, Valentini. Would love to Likewise. meet you. You've been a great viewer lately. 
Steve, sir, you're welcome, buddy. Thanks for showing up. Kelly Winters, thank you very much. Jeff, uh, Ryan O'Hara, great to have you. Jeffrey Hart, same thing. <laughs> Jeff wants to know how much for a hat. <laughs> Was he U.S. or Canada as well, G Jeremy? Che are you? Do you sell the hats on the on your website? No, I give them to customers. I, I I buy all my materials just to be able to use as marketing items and give them away. I mean, people love it. I mean, they a couple of guys were wearing them at the Dallas show, and a couple of guys have them at the Miami show. It's so much fun to be able to just give them away. So They're you know, a lot of people that you come in and visit, I'll probably give you one. Well, I the reason I said before that before you send anyone a hat, you have to send one to me because I've literally been bugging you for two years for a hat. I know, I, wanted, I know. I I'm sending you two. I'm sending you two, one for you and one for AJ, because AJ had definitely the best questions of the night, for sure. For sure. Well-deserved. Ankesh says, a great show. Convince Andy to join Clubhouse. Are you are you on Clubhouse yet, the app? I'm not it's on Clubhouse. It's an only thing right now. Uh-uh. No, I'm, no, I am a Android user, so sue me. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, okay, no problem. Hey, no problem. Kyle Brown, thank you so much. Says, thank you for sharing so much knowledge. Jeremy Pringle, great to have you. Sanderson says, Jeremy, your daughter had her first sleepover tonight. Mine had her first date. Oh, my gosh. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> no, thanks. Thank you, Dennis, very much. Thank you, Card Collector. Jeffrey Hart is in Boston. Toa. All right. Thank you, Toa. Indie Card Exchange is on my LCS bucket list. That is awesome. Jeff McMahon, thank you so much. Great to have you as always. And uh, Todd McDonald, same to you. All right, Andy, hang tight one second. Everybody okay. else. Thank you for joining the show tonight. We'll see you again. We'll see you on After Hours. If you don't stick around, if it's too late for you, we'll see you next week on the regular Sports Cards Live with Dave Sleepka. Good night. If not, have a great week ahead, everybody. We'll see you soon. Take care. Thanks for joining.